Anything you need? Anything you need me to do tonight, Steve? Hey, Steve. Anything you need me to do tonight? You got everything. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Just checking. Just checking. Patrick, let me use your pen for one second. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'd love to be leaving tomorrow morning. Love to be what? Love to be leaving tomorrow morning. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah. He's trying to be like me. The first one's trying to be like me. Mm -hmm. He is. He's just like a taller version of you. Taller, better looking. No. Yeah. You are so good looking. You're hilarious. I'm sitting at the, uh, at the uh, Ellery Creek Trail opening. I don't think we've given Javier an excused absence. I don't think we need to do that tonight, don't we? Yeah, I can't. I don't think she has for a while. Look at you up there working for up there working for us. Every time I got that ding, I was like, working for us. Look at look at look at You got the mint green. You got the traditional gray blue. Nice. Nine o'clock, nine o'clock. Let's do a little bit. We can do this. Oh, oh. Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order for Monday, uh, June the 18th, 2018 at 7 p.m. And I want to certainly want to welcome all of you all in attendance. And now, uh, could you... Please join me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now recognize Council Member Charlie Reese to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if it's your practice to do so, uh, and um, please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And now uh, I'm going to ask Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I'm going to ask for a motion to give an excused absence to Councilmember Caballero, who was traveling today. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. And now we're going to proceed to our ceremonial items. And we are going to begin with the neighbor spotlight tonight. And I'm going to ask Estella Ball if she would come up here to the microphone and bring any family members and friends that you would like to bring, Ms. Ball. Bell. It sure is. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Bell. I apologize. Thanks for getting me right. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm glad to see you again. Hey, hey, Pam. Hey, nice to see you. I'll come on up here and look that way. Okay. Um, Ms. Bell. I'm about to present this to you, but first I'm going to read a little something about you, and then I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone and say whatever you want. How does that sound? Sounds like you're going into me. Okay, great. <laughs> Estella Bell is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of June 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members 
that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Estella Bell, a resident of the East Durham community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, building a team, applying for and receiving a neighborhood matching grant to provide free sewing classes in East Durham, consistently sharing resources and information with neighbors and inviting them to participate in community meetings and events, being a pillar in supporting neighbors, whether providing an extra bite to eat, helping with cleanups, or connecting to opportunities. Yes, sir. It's been hard, too. Well, it, it sounds like you're doing it well, Ms. Bell. Congratulations, Mrs. Bell, on being the June Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham. Thank you for all of the work that you do to support the Durham community. And if there are any other residents that are here to support you, are there other neighbors and friends who are here as well? Is there anybody here to support me? Uh, Everybody's here. Uh, yeah. Ms. Bell, actually everybody is here to support you. Yes, sir. And I'm going to present you with this Neighbor Spotlight Award and ask if you would say a few words to us about your work in your neighborhood. You don't want a few, do you? I do want a few, <laughs> but just a few. Go for it. Good evening, everybody. My name is Estella Bell, and I found out that it takes a village to empower the neighborhood and to let everybody know that there are so many accolades out there that can empower people whether it's just something like the food co-op thing or if it's something like trying to help people with housing or whatever. People need so much. And so if you are a neighborhood supporter the way you come to the neighborhood things and you empower people to take the information back to them, then you empower people to be productive people to know you're not alone. So don't get confused. There is help out there for you if you want it. But you got to reach out to because it takes a village to empower a neighborhood or whatever needs to be done. And with that, I'm through. Because I could talk more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's get our picture taken. We're going to get our picture taken. Oh, look, look, look. Come on, come on. Oh, come on. Taylor. Oh. <laughs> this is Val. Stand up here with us. Come on. How do we look, Jacob? Mm -hmm. Good idea. He's <laughs> hugging me. I couldn't hold it up. He's, <laughs> he's holding me tight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Congratulations. We got a talk to you. I have to talk to you. You know where to find me. I know where to find you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank everybody. <laughs> and now we have a. Another wonderful presentation. Uh, as you all know, Durham is a baseball town. I also want to say, Councilmember Reese, that, that Durham is a Duke town. Mm -mm. No good. doubt about it, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very pleased today that we have with us coaches from the Duke baseball team, which has just had a fabulous season. And I would like to ask you all to please come up, and we're going to uh, make a little uh, presentation for you all. Come on up, everybody. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. I'm really glad you all are here. How are you? Great. Thanks for being here. Great. Well, as you all know, the, the baseball players... Um, our students, and as such, when the season ended, I hope they're gone on to enjoy themselves a little bit for the summer and, and then come back ready for another, a new school year and a new season. But we're lucky, very lucky, to have, uh, as you can see, the coaches here with us tonight. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and I'm going to read this proclamation, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, Coach, Coach Chris Pollard to say a few words to us. Uh, Coach, why don't you come on up here next to me when I do this, all right? Uh, whereas the 2018 Duke Blue Devil baseball team under the leadership of Coach Chris Pollard just concluded one of the finest seasons in the program's history, and whereas the Blue Devils' 45 wins set a school record, and whereas the team advanced to the first Super Regional in school history and finished just one win shy of the College World Series, and whereas five Blue Devils were named as all ACC selections and seven members of the team were selected in the Major League Baseball draft, 
And whereas this Blue Devil team represented Duke University in the city of Durham with class, style, and grit. And whereas Durham is famous the world over as a baseball town and boasts the current national minor league champions, the beloved Durham Bulls. And whereas the 2018 Blue Devils have added to the storied history of baseball in Durham. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of June 18, 2018, as Duke Blue Devil Baseball Week in Durham, and hereby urge the residents of Durham to observe this great occasion. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this 18th day of June, 2018. Stephen M. Shul, Mayor, and Coach Pollard, I'm going to present this to you and ask you to say a few words to us. So thank, thank you. you First and foremost, I want to thank Mayor Shul and the City Council for having us and taking the time out to recognize this team and what they've accomplished. It was a really special year. As you heard, uh, a school record 45 wins, a, a record number of ACC wins at, at 18. Um, we won the NCAA Regional Championship in Athens, Georgia, and advanced to the Super Regional for the first time. We came up... Uh, maybe one or two clutch hits shy of, of being in the College World Series and not being able to be here with you today. But uh, this team uh, was special on a lot of levels, uh, as you heard, not only because of the wins, uh, not only because of the seven players drafted, uh, but in addition, they were a group of players that this city can be proud of. Uh, they represented Duke with a lot of character and a lot of class. They represented this community with a lot of character and a lot of class. And in addition to what they accomplished on the field, uh, all 10 of our Duke seniors that were eligible to graduate graduated this spring, uh, one of them with a master's degree. And this team culminated this uh, historic season, we just found out a little while ago, with a 3.3 uh, grade point average for the year. So not only were they uh, winners on the field, but they were winners in the classroom. Uh, so as Mayor Shul said, they're out this summer, uh, they're playing summer baseball, they're taking classes, they're preparing to, uh, to come back and take that next step next year. Uh, so they couldn't be here with us, but uh, the folks behind us uh, could. We have an unbelievable staff. Our, our assistant coaching staff, our strength coach, our athletic trainer, our administrator, our videographer, and our sports information director. Very fortunate that we've got a staff that's worked incredibly hard to assemble this team here at Duke and has done an unbelievable job of developing them into not only uh, great players, uh, but great men and great representative for Duke. So I want to say thank you to this tremendous staff behind me, if you'll join me in recognizing all that they've done. <laughs> Mayor, thank you very much. We thank appreciate it. Thank you very it. much, Coach. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. I should also add, on behalf of my friends who are Carolina fans, that we wish our Tar Heel brethren the best in the next round. So, <laughs> good luck. Uh, and now we're going to finish with uh, one other uh, special, uh, very special moment today. Uh, uh, here he comes. Uh, here is, our, here is our public historian, Eddie Davis, uh, who is going to bring us a history moment. Eddie, thank you for being here very, very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Shule, um, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, uh, City Council members, staff members, it feels good to be back here again <laughs> with you all and uh, to, be, see, to see all the folks here. Um, Mayor Shule asked me earlier in the year if I would take some time over the course of this year, leading into April of 2019, to sort of um, uh, do some highlighting of some of the events, uh, people, places, events, um, uh, institutions that have, uh, that have been here in Durham uh, during the time from 1869 until 2019. And that will be 150 years uh, since the actual General Assembly uh, incorporated the city of Durham. Um, so we've been meeting with some people around uh, Durham and trying to talk about some actual events. Uh, but Mayor wanted me to come to just talk a little bit about some of the events along the way at some of the city council meetings, not to take up uh, too much of the time, but to have sort of moments. Uh, many of you are old enough to remember the bicentennial moments that we had uh, back in 
1976. And I, when I say that, I think back how long ago that's been. Um, so a lot of people um, may not have been born. I, I guess some people in here may not have been born at that point. Uh, but there are certainly are moments that we remember. And we want to do some of the same kinds of things uh, here for the sesquicentennial of the city of Durham. Uh, this afternoon, I want to just talk a little bit about the building that's just about a block away from here uh, on um, East Chapel Hill Street. Uh, it is the Durham Post Office. Uh, many of us may go into there to conduct to, to that building to buy stamps, uh, to have other transactions, uh, to apply for a passport, to do all kinds of things. But there are obviously things about that building that many of us may not know. Um, the building has been there since 1933. Uh, so if we see the construction that we recognize that may cause a little bit of a problem here in 2018 downtown, um, imagine the construction problems, uh, the, the problems with traffic and other things that were going on in 1933. Um, so there were problems that people may have had, but there were good problems in the sense that the uh, building did get built. Uh, many of us also may not be aware that the building not only serves as a post office, but on the second floor, uh, the middle district of the United States Federal Court um, exists on that second floor. Um, and there are some outstanding things that have gone on there uh, that have had a great deal of import uh, for the city and the county and the nation. Um, I want to introduce to you, if he will stand, um, the... Uh, Federal Magistrate Judge Joe Webster, uh, who is the person who maintains that um, federal court building, uh, federal court uh, area on the second floor. Uh, he has done a good job there, and he is in and out of uh, this whole middle district. The middle district, for those of you who are attorneys, uh, know that um, there are courtrooms in Durham, in Winston-Salem, and in Greensboro. Uh, but there have been some exciting things that have happened uh, that have been uh, greatly important uh, to Durham. Many of us know, or may know, that the important case called Epps versus Carmichael uh, took place in the late 40s and early 50s. That was the case where some African-American law students from North Carolina Central uh, were applying to be admitted to the law school at the University of North Carolina. Uh, that was contentious, and it was not done without challenge. Um, the Epps versus Carmichael case was heard right at the second floor of this post office right here. Uh, they did not prevail. Uh, the plaintiffs did not prevail. Uh, the plaintiffs had such people as Floyd McKissick in that class and many other people uh, who went on to great fame. Uh, they lost the case here in Durham. But that case was appealed to the Fourth Circuit out of Richmond, Virginia. And it was the, the case that they lost was overturned. And the University of North Carolina did appeal and asked the Supreme Court to overturn the Fourth Circuit decision. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1951 said no, they were not going to um, overturn that case. And of course, that led to the uh, integration, racial integration of the University of North Carolina Law School. And Floyd McKissick, even though he had already graduated from the University, from North Carolina, what was then uh, North Carolina College uh, Law School, did go and take a class during the summer of 1951 uh, just to make sure that the school was integrated, and there were several other people who did it. But in that fall, a gentleman who many of you may know, uh, William Marsh, uh, was a member of that first integrated class, uh, full time, full, uh, full term, uh, for the University of North Carolina. It's interesting that the case that was that led to the integration was put forth by uh, was the, the the plaintiffs were defended by, not defended, the, they were uh, advocated for. I don't know the legal term here, Charlie. Uh, how, uh, but, but their lawyers, the plaintiff's lawyers, were Thurgood Marshall and Conrad O. Pearson. Uh, many of you locally may know that Conrad O. Pearson was a famous uh, civil rights attorney, and all of us know about uh, Thurgood Marshall. 
there is a photograph of Thurgood Marshall climbing the stairs of the post office building here in Durham uh, for that trial. I want to let you know that during that period of time, there were lots of other um, <coughs> um, WPA, Works Progress Administration um, uh, buildings that came along with that. Um, the B and Duke Auditorium was built uh, in 1937 with WPA funds. Also, Duke Park, uh, that we all know and enjoy, uh, was built around that same period of time uh, using WPA funds and also the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps funding. Uh, the Durham Armory, which is under the auspices of the city of Durham right now, was built, completed, was built during the 1935 through 1937 period of time, um, and it was converted into, and it was how, uh, built for, to be an armory, uh, and in 1954, it was converted for the civic center use that we now know. The Long Meadow Pool was built in 1937, and several buildings at North Carolina Central, including the B and Duke Auditorium, the Robinson Science Building, Turner Hall, McLean Hall, Rush Hall, and Riddick Stadium, all were built using WPA funds uh, during that period of time. <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention before I take my seat is that the Trinity Park um, tree planting process went on during that period of time, during the 1930s. Uh, WPA funds and CCC funds were used uh, to help with that planting. Um, many of us now have known that we've talked about that over the period of time now about the uh, discrepancy in terms of the tree canopy that we have here in Durham, North Carolina, and how perhaps we should have been a much, much more inclusive, and I think that's probably putting it mildly, uh, to make sure that that canopy would extend it beyond uh, just that aspect of the area. So there are lots of things that we'd like to be able to continue to talk to you about in terms of that the post office building uh, and the courtroom bit there. And there will be an opportunity for us to discuss the, particularly the courtroom aspect uh, in September during Constitution Week. Because not only is this the 150th anniversary of the city of Durham's incorporation, it also is the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And many of the cases that were heard here in Durham and in other parts of the Middle District and in many other cases, uh, courtrooms around the country um, was based on the whole idea of equal access um, based on the 14th Amendment. So we want to make sure that we keep you posted on those kinds of things and to come back from time to time, Mr. Mayor, to uh, let you know about the upcoming programs and activities that we will be doing. Thank you so much for allowing me to have just a moment to talk about some things. Uh, I'll continue to send to you through email uh, issues and um, information about upcoming events. And hopefully the public, uh, those of you who are here, as well as those of you who are in the listening and viewing audience, uh, will be able to attend many of the activities that will go on. We had at one point thought about trying to do one program per month, uh, but many of the other people who are involved in the planning for this sesquicentennial uh, thought that we could do some, since we had the baseball team here, do the exhibition season and then get into the regular season uh, <laughs> when we get into the full year of 2019. Uh, so thank you for allowing us to uh, have an opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you so much, Eddie. <laughs> that was a fabulous history lesson. Thank you so much. Eddie, and Judge Webster, thank you for being here. We're really appreciative of you being here. Thank you so much. And uh, that was a great history lesson, and we are very much uh, looking forward to future history lessons from our public historian. Uh, and, and I should also say, uh, give credit to the city manager. Uh, he said to me one day, you know, we really miss Eddie's history lessons. We should get him back. <laughs> and uh, it has been a smashing success, so thank you so much. Yeah. All right, uh, that was great. And now we're going to uh, uh, move to an, any announcements by the council. Any announcements by any of my colleagues? Any announcements by the council? All right, thank you. And now we'll move on to the first order of business, which is our priority items. Uh, Mr. Manager, any priority items? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items from the city manager's office this evening. 
Mr. Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor and Council. No <coughs> items. Thank you very much. Our second order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, all items on the consent agenda may be approved in a single vote unless an item is removed by a council member or other member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting tonight. And now I'm going to read the, uh, the consent agenda. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, citizens advisory committee reappointments and appointments. Item four, cultural advisory board appoint, Durham Cultural Advisory Board appointments. Item five, mayor's nominee for appointment, Durham Board of Adjustment. Item seven, Durham City County Environmental Affairs reappointment. Item eight, Durham Homeless Services Advisory Committee appointment. Item nine, Durham Open Space and Trails Commission reappointment. Item 10, Durham Sports Commission reappointment. Item 11, Housing Appeals Board reappointment appointment. The at-large alternate member of vacancy was referred back to the city clerk's office. Item 12, Human Relations Commission appointments. Item 13, fiscal year 2018-19 budget and 2019-24 capital improvement plan, CIP and fiscal year 2019-21 strategic plan. Item 14, to re request to amend the 2017, FY 2017-18 budget and other grant project ordinances and amendments. Item 15, Durham City Council Code of Ethics Amendment. Item 16, City of Durham Racial Equity Task Force. This item has been, has been pulled uh, by a uh, resident, and we will uh, consider that item uh, during our general business agenda at the end of the meeting. Item 17, Triangle J Council of Government's Charter Resolution Update. Item 18, Mortgage Loan Servicing Contract with Ameri National Community Service, LLC, DBI, Marinat. Item 19, Supplemental Agreement for U4726 HJ NC751 NC54 Sidewalk Project. Item 20, Grant Agreement for Sidewalk Construction on NC157 Guest Road, EB5834. Item 21, Eno River Outfall and Lift Station Upgrade Phase 1 Project. Item 22, Contract Amendment for North, Water, North Durham Water Reclamation Facility and Acadia Street Waterline Replacement Amendment Number 1. Item 23, reconditioning of biosolids, dewatering equipment at the South Durham Water Reclamation Facility. Item 24, contract with Hydrostructures PA for the 2018 closed circuit television, CCTV inspection and cleaning. Item 25, approval of the 2017 local water supply plan for the City of Durham. Item 26, Durham City County fire consolidation. Item 28, future of the current police headquarters site at 505 West Chapel Hill Street. Item 29, contract with Educational Data System Incorporated to operate Durham's NC Works Career Center and to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, Adult and Dislocated water, Worker Services. Item 30, contract amendment with Eckerd Youth Alternatives, Inc., DBA Eckerd Kids to provide Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, Youth Services. Item 31 can be found on the general business agenda. Item 32, North Carolina Department of Transportation, NCDOT, Utility Agreement for University Drive Culvert Replacement. Item 33, contract for SW30, NC751, NC54 sidewalk project. Item 34, contract for SW-30C, NC751, NC54 sidewalk construction administration inspections. Item 35, contract for ST288A, bridge engineering services for city maintained structures. Item 36, contract for SD287, pavement condition survey. Item 37, contract for SD2018-19 drainage structure access and stabilization. Item 38, amendment number one for processing and marketing recyclable materials contract. Item 39, Microsoft Enterprise Software Licensing Agreement. Item 42 to 46 and 51 to two. These items can be found on the general business agenda public hearings. Item 53, software solution to automate the City of Durham Employee Performance Evaluation Program. You have heard the consent agenda and with the exception of item 16, can I hear a motion on that agenda? So moved. Second. Been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? <coughs> please close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And now before we move to the general business uh, agenda, I'm going to recognize Councilmember Reese for some comments on the budget and ask if any other um, council members would also like to uh, make comments on that as well. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate this uh, opportunity. Uh, first, I want to thank the city manager, Tom Bonfield, and his staff for developing a budget. 
for the upcoming fiscal year of which the people of this city uh, should be rightly proud. Uh, the directors of every city department and their staffs also contributed to making this budget totally awesome. Uh, but I really need to single out our budget director, Bertha Johnson, and her entire staff, not only for the budget document itself, which runs into the hundreds of pages, and the hundreds of hours that went into preparing it, but also for the deep and really unprecedented community engagement effort that Bertha and her staff managed this year in order to hear from Durham residents uh, of all types about their priorities for this budget. So thank you to everyone for that work. Uh, this is the third budget I will have had, I've had the privilege to vote for uh, during my 923 days as a member of this body. Uh, and it is no, by, uh, by no means, this is the best one yet, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and while I, don't, I, don't, I can't take the time to describe everything I like about this budget, I do want to talk in some detail about this year's budget commitment, this year's budget's commitment uh, to uh, our effort to address the affordable housing crisis in Durham uh, through the Community Development Department. Uh, in the upcoming fiscal year, we will spend, by my math, uh, just about $16.9 million in dedicated housing funds as well as federal funding earmarked for affordable housing needs in our community. Uh, that $16.9 million includes uh, roughly $650,000 in new spending to support the city's goals around homeless diversion and eviction diversion, including paying for two lawyers and a paralegal uh, to help stem the tide of Durham's eviction crisis. $350,000 for rapid rehousing for the newly homeless, $2.6 million to support the Durham Housing Authority and their redevelopment efforts, $3.6 million in subsidy for the affordable housing project at Jackson and Pettigrew Streets, which along with the much hoped for federal uh, low income housing tax credit would make that project a reality uh, right in the heart of downtown Durham. Over $3 million for the production and preservation of multifamily affordable housing, another $800,000 for the second phase of home ownership development at Southside, nearly $3 million for small scale production and or preservation of affordable housing, $600,000 for minor home repairs for low income homeowners, and over $500,000 for major home rehab work for low income homeowners. If that seems like a lot of waterfront for one department to cover, you're exactly right. Uh, this is an incredibly ambitious plan for the upcoming fiscal year and it's been proposed by the City of Durham's Community Development Director, the incomparable Reginald Johnson. I'm so impressed with these proposed investments in our, in our city's affordable housing strategy and I'm eager to provide whatever additional support that Mr. Johnson uh, needs during the coming year to meet those aggressive goals. So Reginald, all of us stand with you and we know that you can get this done. As I said, uh, Mr. Mayor, there's a lot to like in this budget in addition to these investments in affordable housing. We're spending on essential and really massive upgrades to our water and sewer system. We're continuing to expand job training and inter internship opportunities for young folks and adults in our city while also working on small business development, especially minority small businesses. And all the while, we will continue to invest in parks, and trails, and bike lanes, and street maintenance, and new sidewalks. And all of this, Mr. Mayor, and many more besides, all of this will be accomplished here in this city without raising property taxes this year on the people of Durham. So in closing, I just wanna say that this budget doesn't solve all of our problems here in the city. No budget possibly could. But this budget uh, we just passed unanimously represents a significant down payment on the work we must continue to do in the years to come to improve the lives of the people of this city. And I don't know about you, Mr. Mayor, but I'm not done yet, so. But I am done speaking on the budget, thank you. <laughs> Well, that was an absolutely awesome statement on the budget, Councilmember Reese. Thank you. Uh, other colleagues, any other comments on the budget or anything else that you would like to address? Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had a few comments as well, and I'll start as well by uh, first thanking our city manager, Tom Bonfield, for his tireless efforts and once again bringing everyone together to create this fantastic budget document. And I also wanted to shout out Tom for giving us all the opportunity to drink cider up here at his budget <laughs> presentation a few weeks ago, which was really exciting for us all. Um, so this, I believe that this is, a, you know, along with Charlie, this is the best budget that we've seen in three years. And it's a strong statement and an investment in our city. And I wanted to highlight a few, a few things that I'm excited that we are investing in. Um, and of course, I think affordable housing, our investment in affordable housing is, one of the critical ways that we're gonna build um, strong, inclusive neighborhoods in our city. And with our two pennies for housing, we're making progress towards all of our affordable housing goals. Um, and I also wanna highlight the expanding housing choices work that's happening in the planning department, which is looking internally at ways that city zoning and regulation make it difficult to build affordable housing and how 
we can um, change those regulations to make that more uh, more easy for, our, for developers. So I wanted to, sh again, shout out Reginald Johnson and also Pat Young with the planning department for all of their work on, um, on moving those initiatives forward. I'm excited about our investment in civic engagement and participatory democracy through launching participatory budgeting, um, which will put $2.4 million of public money directly into the hands of all of our residents. So residents who don't ordinarily have access to making these political decisions that affect their lives because they're immigrants, because they're youth, because they may have a past criminal conviction or for any other reason, will be able to participate directly in this participatory budgeting process. And I wanna um, shout out the budget department under budget director Bertha Johnson for all of their hard work on participatory budgeting and also um, on, of course, the budget in general. Um, and we're investing in innovation with our Idea Starter um, program, which puts the ideas of city employees into action. And our I-Team, which we just got a really exciting report from about the strategies that they'll be implementing to help um, folks who are re-entering uh, the city of Durham after spending time in jail or prison. And that's supported by a Bloomberg Innovation Grant. And amazingly, we got another Bloomberg Grant uh, to use behavioral economics to try to reduce traffic in downtown. And anyone who drives in downtown knows that that's something um, that we need to manage and is one of those critical quality of life issues that inevitably result from the growth that we're experiencing as a city, uh, which has you know, resulted in things like being able to create this fantastic budget without a tax increase, but has also resulted in um, things like increased traffic that we, need to, that we need to work out how to deal with. Um, and finally, we're investing in our future with a fantastic strategic plan refresh that focuses on themes like shared prosperity, community safety, and sustainability. And I think it does a fantastic job of communicating our city's values to our residents um, and to the broader public. And the work that staff had, have put into the strategic plan, in addition to all the work that they do just to you know, manage and do their regular jobs, is laying a strong foundation for this community to grow into the future. And so I want to uh, recognize all of our goal champions and all the staff that worked on bringing us um, the strategic plan. Um, our, I believe our decisions about how we allocate and spend public money are some of the most critical and important decisions that we'll make in public office. And I'm so glad that we have a fantastic staff who make it easy for us to make fantastic decisions about, um, about, how, we spend, about how we spend our community's um, collective resources. And that this budget is a strong statement of what we value as a city and a community. And I'm really excited that we're, um, that we're headed in a fabulous direction as a city. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic statement. Anyone else, colleagues, anything else? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, um, <clears throat> I'm one of the newest people on the council, and let me tell you, the learning curve is real. <laughs> but what is also real is the excellence of this staff. Um, I was a fan of Durham before I ran for office. Now I'm a fan with a cape. I'm a super fan. Uh, and you should be extremely proud, all of the residents watching tonight and all of you listening in, in the chamber tonight, of the people we have working for this city. They are nothing short of remarkable. So I want to shout out, in, in keeping with tradition, uh, the city manager and all the staff for helping us through this learning curve and for producing, really, uh, a remarkable uh, document, a remarkable budget. This is my first budget, I can tell you. Uh, with about six months in office, this is the most, one of the most important things I've ever done in my life, making a decision on how to spend other people's money, a lot of it. <laughs> a half billion dollars with no tax increase. I'll say this, I'm very excited that within that budget there is about $200,000 to help keep people in their homes with eviction diversion, because I can tell you, if you're worried about losing your house, you're not really caring about how nice our parks are or how great our restaurants are. So I'm very proud of my colleagues in this council for taking some concrete steps to addressing the most basic needs of our most vulnerable citizens. I will say this uh, in conclusion. It's been said that a, a budget is a moral document. I wanna tweak that a little bit. A budget is reflective of the morals of those that show up, that show up to the conversation, that are at the table. We've unanimously passed this budget tonight, but I want to say to my fellow residents and citizens, both here and watching at home, the discussion for the next budget starts now. It starts tonight. It starts tomorrow. And if there are things that you need uh, for your community, if there are things that you think are not reflective of your uh, desires and, and your wants, then let's talk. Let's, let's engage 
in the conversation now because the jockeying begins now for the next budget. I'm glad for the learning curve this one, but I'm looking forward uh, to participate in the next process as a veteran. Uh, congratulations to the staff and congratulations to my colleagues. I'm very proud of this budget. Um, and I, I think it shows now that we're a grown up city. We've crossed the half billion dollar budget. Um, <laughs> we're grown up now, we're big time. And I look forward to beginning the discussions for what our next one will look like. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that wonderful statement, council member. Anyone else? All right. Uh, thank you for those statements. And I, I hope our staff um, took in the praise that was just heaped upon you. It is well-deserved. And, and we appreciate it very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. You can see how much you're appreciated, and the appreciation is genuine, and all of us share it. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, that, was, that was fun. Uh, and now we're going to move on to some more fun things. Uh, we're going to start the general business agenda. Uh, item 31, the tire mulch report. Uh, we have two speakers on this. Um, and I'm going to ask the speakers to please come to the podium to my right. Uh, and you'll each have three minutes. Uh, the first will be Lenora Smith. And the second will be Kristen Henry. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? All right. Ms. Smith, welcome. You have three minutes. Please uh, give us your name and address. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Lenora Smith, 1001 North Roxborough Street, here in the city of Durham. So first of all, um, I'd like to just acknowledge the next speaker and welcome uh, and thank her for her commitment, Kristen, um, to this cause. I also would like to just thank the um, Northeast Central Durham Leadership Council for their leadership on this issue and also just like to recognize um, Councilwoman uh, Council Member Freeman and Council Member Johnson and their um, outspoken um, support of the issues surrounding tire mulch. I'm going to read my comments so I can get them all in. Oh, oh, and before we move on, I would also like to recognize Parks and Recreation because um, I really do appreciate the work that they do. There will be a little um, criticism um, about one aspect of the tire mulch issue that we um, are addressing this evening, but overall, I do think that they are worthy of the praise that they recently received from council this evening. <clears throat> Dear Mayor Shul and city council members, thank you for your attention and responsiveness to the East Durham Park tire mulch issue an environmental concern that resonates throughout the East Durham community because continued exposure to the toxins in, t in the tire mulch potentially threatens the health of children who play in the park. While I appreciate your attention and responsiveness, I am personally disappointed that Durham Parks and Recreation did not float the proposed recommendations to community leaders for feedback before they made their recommendations to council. Community leaders have invested many hours of research, translation, public speaking, and otherwise educated staff on this topic, and in the end, DPR acted unilaterally, unilaterally in their recommendation to the manager and to the council, thus negating the value of the community in resolving the tire mulch issue. Initially, I and the broader community were pleased with the directive from council to the city manager at the April 5th work session to explore options to remove the tire mulch from the park. In the May 29th memo from DPR to the city manager, two options were recommended to address the tire mulch. Option A was to do nothing in anticipation of a total playground replacement in 22 in 2022. Option B was to implement a workaround option that removed the loose tire mulch from the park and to replace it. Wow. Miss Smith, um, your so time is up. Would you like to finish? Because my with time it? is yeah. up. Mm -hmm. um, what I do have this in writing and I will submit it to the clerk of court and mm -hmm. I do have copies for the council. 
But overall, um, I would like to ask that the um, council, I wonder if the council can allow the community time to interact with um, Parks and Recreation to resolve this issue and to have discussion on it. And if so, how would that impact the approval of the funds to um, address the mulch that's in, um, the loose mulch in um, the park? Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Henry? Welcome, you have three minutes. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kristen Henry, and I live at 213 North Briggs Avenue in Old East Durham. I'm not gonna back up, because I only have three minutes. Um, so, as you heard, our neighborhood was excited to hear the news that things are moving forward to replace the tire mulch at our park. Even better news was hearing that you all are looking to allocate the money from a general fund rather than putting us against another neighborhood. I really appreciate that, and I think the other residents do as well. Um, but then we were surprised to find out that DPR is only planning on removing the loose tire mulch, not the bonded rubber that's essentially glued together tire mulch. Did you know that that's only half of the mulch that's due to be removed? Um, this is an important detail for a few reasons. Um, the loose mulch is in the southern half of the playground, the, where the swings and the younger kids' slides are. The bonded tire mulch is in the northern half. It's, it all looks like the same playground, so I don't know if that detail was understood. Also, the bonded tire mulch, since it's in that northern half, will still be exposed. It's not a layer underneath that's going to be covered up. This is not similar to the Duluth solution that was mentioned back in the April work session because they didn't use rubber that was sourced from tires um, around the footers where they needed it for safety. So the compromise that was offered by DPR actually almost slipped through without our full understanding or consultation. Uh, the detail was not discussed at the June 7th work session and it was not pointed out it was not pointed out to any of the residents when we were updated on the details. I'm wondering where this got lost, because I, I probably don't have to tell you, I know I don't have to tell any of you, that community awareness and feedback is crucial in making sure that neighbors who are affected and have fought for this issue are also part of the decision-making process. I'm not totally sure what the options are at this point, uh, I do want to urge you to consider removing all of the tire mulch at Eastern Park, both the loose and the bonded. I know that this is not a cheap option. It's, though, what neighbors have asked for. If there is to be a compromise, then I ask, what is our assurance that rubber sourced from tires is not used in our park again? I urge you to put a moratorium on the use of recycled tire products in all parks moving forward. And if you feel strongly in favor of DPR's option B, I'm wondering, is there still a chance for the neighborhood to be informed of what this means and to weigh in? I appreciate how you've been responsive with this issue um, throughout, throughout this process, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Appreciate your being here. Council members, um, first of all, uh, uh, I will, I'll open this for discussion, and then maybe we'll uh, have a motion after that. Comments or questions? Or a motion? I'll also accept a motion. Mr. Mayor, I have a question for staff on this issue. Hello, Tom Dawson, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you, too. Would you walk us through the anatomy of the decision making? process that led to you guys recommending um, Piney Wood as opposed to any other project being yes. being delayed? Um, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the recommendation for Piney Wood, so uh, DPR uh, um, examines all of the many, many uh, assets within the park system and uh, comes up with our professional opinion to prioritize them. Uh, we prioritize safety, um, especially um, in regards to uh, liability, safety to the public. We prioritize um, playability. Uh, issues that come up on the halfpenny uh, list uh, include wall slump for safety and, and uh, along the American Tobacco Trail. Piney Wood uh, is, a, um, is an issue that we want to, to address. Uh, Piney Wood is a, um, 
more of a playability issue and a rentability issue. It's a field that's fallen because of uh, grading uh, and drainage below our standards for acceptable uh, play. So we can no, can no longer rent that field at this point, and we need a uh, more of a field replacement. Uh, this is an issue. We felt it to be an important issue, but it didn't uh, weigh as heavily on our mind as, as many of our other issues. Does, does the field hold any danger to the public in your assessment? Or? Um, fields can hold danger to the public. Uh, they, this, uh, because of, um, in, in a lot of different ways, this has more of um, uh, not so much a danger to the public, but more of a playability issue. It, um, we do not want to rent a field that has um, more lopsided grading. It holds water for longer, but it's not considered a health and safety issue. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mr. Any Mayor, other? I, and I do have comments after. I'll okay. yield for now. Mr. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Councilmember Freeman? Oh, yes. Thank you. I um, want to thank um, both Lenora Smith and Kristen Henry for being here tonight and sharing their concerns about the way that communication has worked in this process. I understand and I want to let you know, like, I'm, I hear you and I want to make sure that we're being as clear and transparent with this process as possible, but I want to make sure that I acknowledge that we move forward with the loose tire crumb, recognizing that there would need to be a larger look at the issues for the entire park system if we were to talk about the tire mulch as a whole. And so just recognizing that there's a balance that has to be made, um, I, I just ask that you uh, continue to stay involved and engaged in the process. Thank you, council member. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Milton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um. Th this issue for me has really been been a a, a primer in in government, um, and the government's responsiveness uh, to the people. The reason why I asked staff about the 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 rationale, the the methodology with coming up with the Pineywood decision, uh, is because I I I've been struck by. Uh, this language that suggests that we're putting, we could be putting one neighborhood against another. Um, and the reality is governments make decisions all the time uh, in terms of weighing one decision against another. Uh, that, that's what we do. In this particular sense, it's been brought to the light of day, but um, that's what we do. We look at the options that we have in front of us, and then we make uh, a decision. Where am I going with this? I um. The staff recommended um, not denying the Pineywood project, but delaying it. I think that the language of putting one neighborhood against another might be more useful uh, the next time one of these decisions comes before us and we actually say no to someone. We haven't said no to anyone in this situation. We have uh, recommended, the staff has recommended um, foregoing or stall, uh, uh, delaying a decision on Pineywood for about a year. I'm inclined uh, to go with the staff recommendation, and I say this for this reason. Saying that it's just $20,000, um, and I've seen some of the emails that we've gotten around this issue, saying that it's just $20,000 to me is re really not useful uh, as a decision maker. Um, my dad always used to say, it's never a lot of money when it's somebody else's. Uh, it's easy uh, to spend other people's money. Uh, I, I think this is a good time for us to send a signal uh, to residents and to citizens and to taxpayers that we take making tough decisions as a government seriously, uh, that we've been elected to make decisions and to weigh uh, consequences one against the other. For me, you know, I, I, I as a, a fiduciary of the city of Durham, I kind of look at our checking account and our savings account the way I look at my own household finances. Um, I don't raid my savings account unless I absolutely have to. There are just things that I'll go without and put it off um, until I can afford it. And if I have to go into savings, um, then I will. Based upon what the staff has said and based upon their methodology, I don't think this is one of those times where we need to go uh, into the, the family savings account, uh, as it were, of this issue. I support um, replacing the tire mulch, um, but I don't think that we need to go into the general fund. And I, I also reject the, the minimization argument. By that, I mean it's just $20,000. Uh, we could say in the same voice, it's just a year. It's only 12 months, and we get to save $20,000. Um, no one's going to be hurt, and we're going to be able to rent 
the soccer field when it's repaired, and we'll get that money back uh, in due time. I think this is a good opportunity to, to send a signal uh, to the folk that put us here that we take uh, making decisions and exercising a, a, a judicial, a financial judiciousness seriously, uh, that we're very sober, and that we have a very high bar. The reason why we have a general fund is precisely because we make decisions, and we don't do everything we can do, our capacity may allow us to do at that particular moment. That's why we have a savings account. Um, and I think that, again, I'll, I'll say this and I'll put a point on it. Let's talk about what putting one neighborhood against another looks like the next time a neighborhood comes and asks us to do something and we say no. Not we're gonna delay it, we say no. And then they ask us what's the difference between that neighborhood and this one. I think that will be a more informative conversation in terms of putting one neighborhood against another. Uh, I'm inclined to go with the staff recommendation to delay Pontywood for a year and I wanna fix the tire mulch, tire mulch issue uh, in East Durham Park. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments or a motion? Can I get a motion on this item? I'd like to make a motion that we move forward with the tire mulch report and approve. Okay, you, you, the motion is to move forward with the tire mulch report and to remove the tire mulch? And remove the loose tire mulch. Okay, and but the question is also, we need to, to decide this question of, uh, the recommendation is that this be funded uh, by delaying the, the planned half penny for parks and trails funded repair to Pontywood soccer field for one fiscal year. With the, with the language to include the funds from the fund balance for okay. $20,000. So you're moving that we uh, adopt the staff report and that we pay for it uh, through uh, funds from the fund balance? Yes. Okay, is there a second? Second. All righty, any more discussion? Um, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Alston. Thank you. Uh, I previously had uh, reservations about paying for this project from our fund balance, but um, recognizing the will of the majority of this council, I plan to vote in favor um, for pulling the $20,000 for this project from our fund balance, so I just wanted to. All righty, thank you very much. Any more comments? Any more comments? Okay, we have a motion on the floor that would remove the uh, tire mulch, uh, the loose tire mulch, um, and that, uh, that it would be paid for through uh, an taking the, from an appropriation from the fund balance. Thank you for that language, Mr. Manager. Uh, and I'm going to ask the city clerk to please open the vote. <clears throat> Close the vote. Motion passes four to two with Council Member Middleton and, Council and Mayor Shule voting no. Thank you very much. All righty, we'll now move on to item 42. Uh, the, this is a public hearing item, the Consolidated annexation, annexation for 3112 Blue Hill Lane. And we will hear the report from staff. have been received um, from one contiguous parcel located at 3112 Blue Hill Lane. Um, this uh, annexation petition represents an, exist, um, an extension of the existing city limit, um, and if approved, the request will become effective on June 30th, 2018. Um, if these motions are approved and a public street is approved to city standards, the site will ultimately become a city street uh, upon completion of the road and the annexation into the city. In order for the city to accept maintenance of a street, the street must be within the city's jurisdiction, and this petition represents one step in that process. Um, this street is intended to connect two residential developments. Um, you can see that on attachment four, the utility map in your packet. Um, residential development located along Andrews Trapper Road to the east, and what is effectively known as the Yancey Parcel to the west. This proposal also had a utility extension agreement um, that is in your packet. The Public Works and Water Management Departments reviewed that item and determined that there is adequate water and sewer service for these properties. Staff determines overall that this request is consistent with applicable plans and policies. Action will require three votes 
one on the annexation petition and extension agreement, the second one on the consistency statement, and then finally action on the initial zoning designation. <coughs> I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Thank you very much, Jacob. You have heard the report from staff, and I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open. And I'm gonna first ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. I have one question, Jacob. Uh, is this a description, is this an accurate description of this item? It is connecting an island of land within the city limits by so, a new road to the larger city area. Is that correct? Um, somewhat. I would say it's connecting a satellite annexation to the east, um, that what is known as the Yancey parcel. So it is making that parcel contiguous to the city limits at large. By the... Uh, by by in, uh, by uh, annex, annexing land that will essentially be a road. Correct. Yeah. It all the intent, um, the developer's intent is to create a, a public street that connects these two residential communities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, all righty. Uh, any other questions for staff? If not, we have one speaker on this item. Although it looks like maybe two speakers signed this card: Charlie Yokely and James Tucker. Um, are signed up as proponents. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item before I get started here? Yes, sir. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Charlie Oakley with the McAdams Company, 2905 Meridian Parkway in Durham. Um, I don't have anything else to add. Jacob covered it pretty well. This is annexation is to cover a street connection that's required for the development of the ANSI tract and then the utilities that will be installed in that right away as well. Um, so I won't take up much time, but if you have any questions for me, I'll, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Sir. M Mr. James T Tucker also signed up. Mr. Tucker, are you here? Would you like to speak? All right. Thank you very much. Um, all righty. Uh, colleagues, do you have uh, any questions or comments at this point? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, do I hear a motion to adopt an ordinance annex annexing 3112 Blue Hill Lane? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the annexation ordinance. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Madam Clerk, I don't think your microphone's working, but I believe you said that the motion passes six to zero. Yes. Thank you very much. Now, well, do I hear a motion on uh, to adopt the consistency statement? So moved. moved. Second. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes six zero. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO by taking property out of residential rural, establishing the same as residential rural zoning for the subject site? So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. All righty. Uh, we will now move on to item 43, uh, the consolidated annexation for JC Electric Initial. And we will hear the report from staff. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. Um, and I would like to note that the previous case, as well as any planning cases you'll hear this evening, have been uh, published and um, advertised in accordance with local and state law, and affidavits are on file on the planning department noting such. Um, this item is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning designation um, for a 9.9 acre parcel generally located at 4915 Hillsborough Road. Um, this request represents an ex expansion of the existing city limit and would be effective on June 30th, 2018 in the event that the item is approved. Um, this subject site is currently divided between Orange and Durham counties. Um, and is presently connected to the city of Durham Water Main. Um, there is new development proposed for the site, which is triggering the annexation requirement for the additional utility connections. Um, 
Staff is recommending an initial zoning designation of industrial light for the site. It's presently zoned uh, Eno, de Eno uh, Economic Development Eno Higher Intensity 2, sorry, in Orange County. The industrial light zoning designation is the most analogous zoning designation to that. The proposed development has submitted a utility extension agreement for review to the Public Works Department. The Public Works and Water Management Departments found that there is adequate service for this site. Um, and the Budget and Management Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis, which noted that this request is likely to be revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan, applicable policies and ordinances. Action will require three motions to approve, one for the annexation petition and the extension agreement, one for the consistency statement, and then finally one for the initial zoning designation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, you've heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. Uh, and first ask if there are any any questions by staff by council members for the staff I have some questions Jacob. Yes, sir um, This is rezoning to industrial light next to a residential neighborhood. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct What are the anticipated uses the recreational facility? My understanding is that will be an outdoor recreation facility that use in of itself will require minor special use permit from the Durham Board of Adjustment. If this property is annexed, they will then have to proceed right. to the Durham Board of Adjustment for that item. Thank you. Yes, sir. There has already been a site plan submitted for this. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. And how does the site plan buffer the next door neighborhood? So the site plan will have a required buffer. The IL to RS20 buffer is typically um, going to be a 0.6 or 0.8 opacity buffer that the applicant will have to provide along that property line. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right, uh, any other questions for staff at this point? Just a quick question. Why, well, first is how does this play out for us in, um, I mean, this property being entirely in Orange County and we coming in and applying a city annexation, what does that mean for Orange County specifically? I'm not sure. So the, this area is part, or basically the city has an annexation agreement with Orange County to annex properties in this area. Um, so the site, if they are annexed, they will still pay Orange County property taxes, but they would also pay city of Durham taxes for the services they receive. This is, I think we should describe further, and I'll try to describe it, and uh, the manager or others can help me, but... Uh, this was done uh, as a, an agreement with, that we've struck with Orange County previously because we, they, our utilities are near there and theirs aren't. Okay. And so that's why this arrangement was made. Is that a correct? Uh, that's correct. And it includes uh, a, a much larger area, the Eno Economic uh, Development District area. Uh, this is just the, uh, the portion, a portion that is immediately adjacent to the, uh, the city limits. Great. And then specifically, why would this go into annexation as opposed to just rezoning? So, since the city does not have any jurisdiction in the area, this is why there's an initial zoning designation process. For so, this. so what yeah. you're saying is there is no agreement in place for an, a rezoning in this case, it's only annexation? Uh, no, no ma'am. So, the three items before you this evening, there's a utility extension agreement, there's an annexation petition, and there's also an initial zoning designation. So I mean, I specifically to Orange County. Oh, for Orange there's, County? There's no agreements in place to do any rezonings in the case like this. It specifically has to be an annexation? Um, I can advise on the Orange County regulations, but in order for the site to receive <laughs> utility approvals, they have to petition for annexation, which then would subject them to the city's requirements. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we have one speaker on this item, uh, Chad Huffan. Uh, Mr. Huffine, could you make your way to the uh, to the to the podium? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on item 43? Anyone else? All righty, uh, sir. Welcome. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Charles Huffine. I'm 505 East Davis Street in Burlington. I'm a civil consultant for the owner. And uh, the five questions that the uh, council members have expressed to Jacob, I, I understand and uh, I concur with Jacob's. 
response to you, and we are here to answer any questions once you begin debate if you need that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. We appreciate your being here. Any more questions or comments by members of the council? Any more questions or comments on item 43? Uh, if not, I'm going to uh, declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Do I hear a motion? Do I hear a motion on uh, to adopt the ordinance annexing JC Electric into the city? Councilor Mayor, I'd ask some. I'm sorry, Councilor Member Reese. My to apologies. Close the public hearing. I don't have any questions for the applicant. This my, isn't my their apologies. fault. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to indulge my occasionally dyspeptic nature and complain about this for a bit. Um, the idea that that the the way that this particular parcel is situated compels us to do this really sticks in my craw. Mm -hmm. um, the and it's not your fault, sir. Not at all your fault. You're doing what you got to do. I totally get it. I understand. Um, first of all, I hate I hate when we annex a part of another county into this city. It creates yet another jurisdictional oddity that we then have to explain to people somewhere down the road. The saving grace for this is no one's building houses here, so these folks don't have that level of uh, problem. Um, but it's, uh, it's still a jurisdictional oddity that I don't care for. Um, the other thing, though, Mr. Mayor, is what you pointed out, which is that this is a adjacent to a uh, residential neighborhood. And um, because of the way that our agreement is drafted with, or with Orange County and the way that initial zonings happen is we try to roughly approximate the existing zoning in the, in, the exist in the jurisdiction where the property current is and then translate that into city zoning of some kind. I'm assuming that's how that works. Isn't that right, Jacob? Is that roughly correct? Um, and so we've done that here um, and the the, the reason that's a problem is that as currently situated in Orange County, they can't provide utilities to this place, this particular piece of property. So the fact that it's roughly um, industrial now is really meaningless because it's you, they can't put it to that use given the current status of the, of the utilities. So it's only by us annexing them and providing them with utilities that they can finally make use of this industrial zoning, which, which I'm sure the use will be Very totally cool. awesome for that particular part of town, not... Uh, again, it's not your fault, um, but that that rankles, Mr. Mayor, and I'm just going to just expressing that now. But as uh, as one of our planning commissioners uh, noted in his written remarks, we uh, there is um, an aspect uh, to the state uh, to this that makes it marginally okay, and that is the state imposed buffer due to the stream that's on the property uh, that creates at least some level of separation between this use and the residential use adjacent. Um, uh, I don't have to like it, but I think it's probably okay under those circumstances and I do plan to vote for it, but I will continue to complain. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for expressing your dyspepsia. <laughs> so nice to hear the word dyspepsia used here at the Durham City Council. <laughs> Council Is that is a Pepsi? I'm sorry. <sighs> <laughs> City manager said he had to look it up. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Any more comments before uh, I uh, open the vote? I'm sorry, before I ask for a motion. All righty. Can I hear a motion uh, to adopt the ordinance annexing J.C. Electric into the city? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Do we have a motion to adopt the consistency statement? So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. I'm sorry, close the vote. <coughs> motion passes 6-0. And do we have a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. All right. We will now move on to item 44, our next public hearing item, the Sycamore Street closing, and uh, we will hear the report from staff. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Uh, Kevin Burke, on behalf of TROSA, requests to permanently close 
465.60 linear feet of Sycamore Street. Um, this portion of Sycamore Street is an unbuilt platted right-of-way that is not maintained by the city of Durham. TROSA owns all of the parcels surrounding this right-of-way, um, and if closed, TROSA will subdivide the property, or subdivide the underlying right-of-way into their existing properties, as shown on the attached street closing plat, seen as attachment four. Um, the request meets all applicable ordinance requirements, and no issues were raised by review agencies during the review of this item. And staff recommends the permanent closure of this portion of Sycamore Street. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Uh, you all have heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to ask council members if there are any questions for staff at this point. If not, there are two speakers on this item. Uh, I'm going to call their names and ask you to please come. Uh, well, okay, so let's see. We have one proponent and one opponent. Uh, the proponent is Ed Hallbach. I hope I have got your name right. Uh, and uh, um, this, the, and then the opponent is Freeman Ledbetter. Uh, are, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Mr. Jewell, would you please uh, go to the table and fill out the card, as is our custom? Um, anyone else? All right. I'm going to uh, give the proponents and the opponents uh, on, this, uh, on this item uh, five minutes each, okay? So are you a proponent, Mr. Jewell, or an opponent? Proponent. So Mr. Jewell and Mr. Halbach, uh, if you all could proceed to the podium to my right, and you all will together uh, have five minutes uh, to speak on this item. And then Mr. Ledbetter, you will be next. Mr. Hallback, please give us your name and address. Good evening, Council. Thank you for your time. My name is Ed Hallberg. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I apologize for my handwriting. No problem. <laughs> on my knee. Uh, I represent the Anthony Property Group, uh, the owner of the property on both sides of the uh, Paper Street that we're asking to be um, uh, abandoned, and uh, so that we can further develop the property uh, from its current uh, from its current use. My understanding is that this is the first step, uh, and is a necessary step before any planning can be done. Uh, I'm really here to answer any questions that I can uh, on a very limited scope. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Jewell. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Dan Jewell, Coulter Jewell Thames. Uh, we have filed this application on the request to TROSA, uh, simply here to answer any questions that you might have about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ledbetter. Is, is Freeman Ledbetter here? Mr. Mayor, if I might, Mr. Ledbetter had a few questions. Uh, I was able to speak with him before the agenda item. He was satisfied, and he and his family went home. Okay. Well, that's good to know. He is an amazing musician, and I was sort of hoping he would be here so I could tell him that. Yes. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? All right. Um, so, uh, if there are any, any questions by members of the council or comments uh, before I close this public hearing? If not, I'm going to declare that this public hearing is closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, the motion required is to adopt an order to permanently close a 465.6 linear foot portion of Sycamore Street. Do I hear a motion on that? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 5-1 with Councilmember Freeman voting no. 
Thank you very much. Let me just say one thing to planning staff, which I've been meaning to say all evening. This is the first time I believe that we've had these fabulous photographs mm -hmm. to go along with the, uh, the zoning cases. And I just want to say what a great addition they are. Um, I love the, the photographs that you've included. Uh, the, the aerial maps are great, but actually having these, these photographs in addition uh, just really uh, bring the cases to light. So, Pat, I want to thank you and your staff uh, and, and just say what, a, what an, another you know, excellent addition to our planning process. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I just really wanted to appreciate you for saying that. That's um, one of the items that we've improved based on you all's feedback so that there's a better sense of the site for you all as you deliberate these cases. And I want to appreciate my staff who are out there taking these pictures in most right. cases. You did a great job. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Okay. We are now at item 45, zoning map change for Rollingdale. And I'm going to first ask for the report from staff. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for zoning map change has been received from Landon Lovelace Underfoot Engineering for two parcels totaling approximately 6.65 acres located at 602 and 606 West NC Highway 54. The subject site is presently zoned residential suburban 20. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of plan development residential 3.940, which is consistent with the low density residential four dwelling units or less designation on the future land use map of the city's comprehensive plan. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a maximum of 25 townhouse units, no building shall be located, um, shall be placed closer than 60 feet from the southern property line, no townhouse building shall be located closer than 30 feet to another townhouse building, the on-site retaining walls will be town, tan, brown, or toned, um, design commitments also include for the garages the use of staggered facades and varied garage door styles and um, exposed foundations of more than 48 inches, inches will be covered with siding or brick stone veneer. The Durham Planning Commission at their April 10th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of this, of this request by a vote of 9 to 5. Staff determines that, these that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. Uh, two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt the consistency statement, and the, st and the second is for the zoning ordinance. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. Uh, you have heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. I want to first ask, ask if there are any questions for staff from members of the council. I have one question, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Forgive me if I missed it in reading uh, the materials. Were, were there any proffers on behalf of the developer? Yes, there were a number of proffers um, on page, going into page two of the staff report. Um, at the top, there were a series of text commitments and design commitments that were all proffers um, after um, they were actually provided at the March 13th, 2018 Planning Commission, and staff had the opportunity to review them after the fact um, and were part of the development plan that was recommended in April. And those were in addition to other uh, text commitments and design commitments, uh, transportation-related commitments that were already on the plan. I must not have refreshed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for staff at this point? If not, we have a number of speakers on this item, uh, and we have three proponents and five opponents. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start out by giving each side 10 minutes. So that would mean uh, for each of the five opponents, you will have two minutes each. Uh, for the proponents, so you'll have a total of 10 minutes. For the proponents, you will also have a total of 10 minutes for your three speakers. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item at this point who has not signed up already? 
All righty, we will start with the proponents, and uh, I'm going to read your names, and if you all could uh, line up over here to my right. Uh, Landon Loveless, Neil Ghosh, and Josh Swindell. Our Mayor Sewell, they, is I'm anyone? speaking on behalf of the applicant, and those are members of the applicant group. They're members of? The applicant group. Landon Loveless is the engineer. And all right. Are they present here? They are right here. All right. So you all are not planning to speak unless there are questions for you. Is that my understanding? All righty. All righty. Mr. Ghosh, you're, the proponents have 10 minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the City Council. My name is Neil Ghosh, and I'm with the Morningstar Law Group here on Main Street. I'm representing the applicant for this rezoning tonight, and let me first start by thanking staff for their presentation. Uh, as you can see, this proposal is for a fairly modest 25-unit townhome community along Highway 54, and you're also probably aware that traffic along Highway 54 can be challenging at times, which I bring up for two reasons. First, the amount of traffic going past this site on a daily basis does not lend itself to single-family detached living on the parcel. The market for residential living uh, on, on parcels fronting thoroughfares like Highway 54 is typically for multifamily or townhomes. And in this case, we've selected townhomes and we think that is a sensible use in this area. The second reason I brought up the traffic was to talk about road improvements. At 25 units, this project simply will not create a lot of traffic. Nevertheless, as I've already mentioned, 54 can be challenging and the need for road improvements is, is certainly there. Uh, on congested roads like Highway 54, uh, traffic can move slowly during rush hour. The most challenging movement in that type of scenario is a left-hand turn across traffic coming the other direction. By contrast, right turns typically are very easy and safe to make when traffic is crawling. Of course, safety always is paramount but resource allocation is also important, especially on small projects like the one proposed here. Mm -hmm. As you can see, uh, we have committed to doing or installing left turn lanes in both directions in this corridor. Uh, these turn lanes will be a real benefit by allowing left turning cars to get out of the way of through traffic while they wait for an opening so they can make the turn. At Planning Commission, it was suggested that a right turn lane is necessary and would make traffic move better in this area. While I cannot contest that additional infrastructure would make traffic move better, uh, the question of necessity in this case has already been answered by your transportation staff and NCDOT. A right turn lane is not needed in order to safely make a right turn into this community. And that should not come as a surprise. There are far more residents and people living off of Rolling Wood Drive and Park Ridge, which are on either side of this project, and, and yet neither of those have a right turn lane. Uh, there's also the church just down the street, and uh, though I don't know this for sure, I suspect that its peak hour generates more, more trips than, than this project will. It also does not have a right turn lane. Given that a right turn lane is not necessary, the question really becomes one of resource allocation. We are of the opinion that these resources could be put to a better use than adding unnecessary impervious surfaces less than 200 yards away from the floodplain area of Jordan Lake and the Army Corps lands just west of the site. I also think there was some confusion at Planning Commission uh, with respect to the bus pullout. The condition we have offered related to bus transit is the standard condition that I'm sure you all have seen many times. There are bus pullouts that have been built all over the city pursuant to the language in this condition. Uh, so my understanding is that the language allows the transit authority to request a bus pullout at time of site plan if they determine one is needed. And if that happens, we will build it. Now I spoke in depth about those topics because those were the biggest issues that we heard at Planning Commission. But I think it's important that you know that the applicant offered other conditions based on feedback from the neighbors. For example, We've committed to uh, a minimum 30-foot building spacing between the townhome buildings to address massing. We also have committed to installing sod on the slopes of any BMP, and, uh, and we're also giving an, an aesthetic treatment to retaining walls. Ultimately, this is a small, responsible townhome community, and it, and it makes sense in this area and is a good use of land. It will also not add a lot of traffic to an area that's already congested, 
but it will provide a benefit to the corridor by installing left turn lanes. We hope you agree with us and the Planning Commission, which recommended approval by a vote of nine to five, and we have members of the development team here to answer any questions that you might have. I do press that we get we reserve the remaining time for any rebuttal if that should be necessary. Thank you very much, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. We will now hear from the opponents. And I have Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, could I ask Mr. Ghosh just a question? Is this a good time for that or should I wait till I later? I think let's wait and let's hear from the opponents and then we'll have the right. question. Is that okay? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Okay. So we're now going to hear from the opponents. Uh, and I have five speakers here. And if you would just line up to this podium to my right uh, as I call your name. Jeff Brandenburg, Ashley Atkins, Percy Murray, Erica Legum, and Jock Carter. All right. Um, you, um, you all have a total of 10 minutes. And you can divide that up any way you like. My suggestion is you might want to take two minutes each, but it's up to you. Welcome. Please uh, give us your name and your address. Thank you for hearing my comments. I'm Jeff Brandenburg. I live at 2 Abingdon Way. Um, we have expressed concerns, as was previously mentioned, about runoff handling and about traffic. Um, I wanted to speak specifically to a couple of the comments on traffic that we just heard. 54 does bog down during peak periods there. My concern is not just with the times when 54 bogs down, though. My concern is when traffic is flowing freely there, except when someone is trying to make a turn. In order to turn into an entrance like this, you need to slow down. When you pull out, you need to speed up. And this entrance is located near a couple of turns that have poor visibility on Highway 54, if you look at the map. We're very concerned that with more traffic coming to a stop or coming onto the road here at a place where we already have problems with accidents, we're going to see a lot more collisions potentially at high speed because traffic does move along there when it's not a peak period. There was mention made of other developments at Rollingwood, um, churches along the way there that do not have right turn lanes. That's true. A couple of those are situated at places where the road is quite straight and visibility is very good. Um, the church is not far away. Well, no, the church is, the church that I think they were talking about, the Catholic Church, is set up at an area where 54 is perfectly straight and visibility is great. There's the Presbyterian Church around on the bend that's very close to my house. We hear screeching tires there quite frequently and occasionally the loud bang or the crash into the woods. Adding more traffic coming in and leaving at this particular spot is creating a risk that's disproportionate to the small increase in total traffic volume that the traffic analysis gave. That was the main point that I wanted to bring up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Brandenburg. Ashley Atkins, welcome. Thank you. My name is Ashley Atkins, and I live at 15 St. James Court in Woodcroft, and I think I caught some of that dyspepsia from Charlie Reese. <laughs> Sounds um, as a good option later. <laughs> um, I live right behind where this development is planned, and I am living right on a creek bed. And this creek bed uh, overflows during even a normal-sized rain, so I am concerned about development happening right above the creek bed. Uh, there's a, a steep slope right above the creek bed, and when that slope is cut into, that could create a runoff problem, um, even if measures are taken to prevent that. Runoff is inevitable. Um, I certainly don't want the creek to overflow onto my property. I'm about three steps away from the creek uh, right now, the developer has a, a buffer of about 110 feet from the creek, and uh, some. And then with some homes, it's uh, only a 60 a foot buffer. Um, at the planning hearing, some committee members recommended that the, that the developer leave at least 200 feet 
between the creek line and the development. Uh, the developer did not follow these recommendations. Uh, I request that the city council either denies this rezoning or delays it so that we can negotiate a more protective plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Atkins. My name is Percy Murray. I live at 33 Churchwell Court. And my house, I would like for you to imagine for a moment, getting up one morning and looking out of your kitchen window or going on your back porch, seeing a wall where there was nothing but pristine forest, where deer come into my backyard, squirrels dig holes in my house coming up, and then there's the creek. This, we've heard about the traffic. This is, there's a lot of traffic on Highway 54. Lots of traffic, left, right, coming out. There's also the issue of the curve on Highway 54, which makes it a really dangerous place to add 25 additional units, notwithstanding what these developers have said. But my concern is, is that I have been in that house for 31 years. I look out my back window and I see trees. Now I'm gonna look out and see the back of somebody's condominium. I'm not opposed to development, but I am opposed to the destruction of a neighborhood. And this is exactly what they would do in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Erica Legum. Hello, Council. My name is Erica Legum. I am a resident of 19 St. James Court who is directly impacted by this rezoning. I'm going to use my minutes to read a statement by Andrew Stilwell, who is president of the Board of Woodcroft, the neighborhood association where we live. To whom it may concern, the Woodcroft Board of Directors would like to express our concern with the proposal Rollingdale Development Plan. While the board understands that property owners have the right to develop in compliance with city ordinances, we are also aware that the planning department uses discretion and carefully considers whether a proposed development integrates well with adjacent properties and contributes positively to the overall community fabric. The board is concerned that the Rollingdale development will not integrate well with Woodcroft, as it should, and that the viability of the development relies on design features that are extreme and do not contribute to a reasonable blending with their Woodcroft neighbors. It is our understanding that the maximum number of trees will be removed from the Rollingdale site creating an entirely different experience for an adjacent Woodcraft resident. One of the main appeals of a Woodcroft property is the extensive mature tree coverage. It is also understood that a large retention pond will be placed to the back of the site. Due to the slope of the site, this retention pond will require a massive retaining wall. With the extensive tree removal during late fall and winter months, there will be no, virtually no screening of this potential massive monolithic feature. We are also concerned about potential flooding of Woodcroft properties due to the increased impervious surface and runoff into the creek shared by both properties. Another development adjacent to Woodcroft, Chamberlain, was recently completed in the last several years, and despite compliance with ordinances, there was still extensive flooding and damage to Woodcroft properties, especially during construction when mitigating features had not been implemented. On behalf of our residents, the Woodcroft Board of Directors request the Planning Department take every measure within their powers to insist that the development of this property be done in a way that is reasonably considerate of the surrounding properties. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lycombe. Uh, we'll now hear from Jock Carter. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Hello, I'm Jock Carter. I live at 19 St. James Court, and I will be directly affected by the proposed rezoning and development. Uh, no one is against growth. We know that Durham area has seen the sharpest growth in the state. My family moved here from California and uh, we wanted to escape from such a busy place and expensive area. And we feel fortunate to live here and we want to see Durham grow into the most successful city it could possibly could be. We invested in Woodcroft because it is a unique development that cultivates small town values while capitalizing on distinctive assets, scenic beauty, architectural character, and a sense of community. All development is not created equal. Some development projects can be make a community better, a place to live, work, and visit, and other developments projects will not. 
The more a community does to protect us and enhance its uniqueness, the more the people will want to seek it out. We do not want a project, we do not think this project will enhance our community. A few reasons we feel this way are, Third Fork Creek is polluted and is on the state's list of impaired waterways. The runoff from the grading and the additional pervious surface puts the watershed in danger and makes our homes at risk of flooding. Highway 54 is already congested in the morning and the evening. Developers would like to rezone and to pave a new way for further development, not just a single project. They want to make more of this. But we can barely manage the situation we have now. This area is served by two bus routes, 5 and 14, but how will people that move into this area make it to these bus stops by crossing the 54 when it's already too dangerous at the same moment we have right now? And Woodcross Mission Mission statement is a development designed to coexist harmoniously with nature. This is a large part of what makes this unique and why we love this area here. Is it necessary in the best interest to remove 80% of the forest in the area and leave the mandatory minimum trees? This does not sound like growth at all for our area. Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? Uh, I, I'm sorry. You, you, you're, you're more than welcome to go and sign up here and uh, to speak. Sir, would you also like to be heard? Please come and, and sign up. That's okay. Hang on just a second, okay? Thank you. All righty, can I ask if you were a, each of you all, are you proponents or opponents of this rezoning? Opponent. Opponent. Okay. There are two more minutes left. Uh, do you think that between the two of you all that will be enough time? Okay. Uh, please tell us your name and your address and go ahead. Thank you. Okay. My name is Maria Girlando. I live in 14 St. James Court. Um, my front yard will be facing the property. I was not going to speak today because I'm too emotional about this issue and I didn't want to be negative, uh, but um, I've gone to the meetings with the developer and they've been a bit deceitful as to the way they presented what they're doing. None of the proffers that they've offered have come from any comments with community meetings. Me, Erica, Ashley, we've all been at the meetings. Um, some of the proffers come from a meeting with a city planning commission member who tried to help, and he thought those proffers would help. But that's where they're coming from. We don't care about the, college of the, the color of garage doors or the color of um, the back of their buildings. Those are minor issues compared to what's really at stake. Um, I do have one suggestion. I've read that in some of the city planning commissions, you can request the builder to have a tree protection plan. We know we have a tree canopy issue with Durham. My concern is not just with the neighborhood, it's also the damage they're doing to Durham because they want to make a profit. And the way to make a profit is to clear the land fully. And they've not at any time offered a care as to what the neighborhood or the city needs. It's all about the profit with them. So I want to let you read it sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, could you give us your name and address? Yes, sir. My name is Steve Garant. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live at 9 Abingdon Way, and I'd like to speak to the traffic. Where my house is, the cars, you might have heard of a bang and then squealing of tires or the other way around. When people crash on Highway 54, they run off into my backyard. And thankfully, there are trees that stop them from literally getting into my backyard. My point is, is that we already have a lot of 
traffic issues on 54 that's adjacent to where they want to build their structure. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, before I ask the proponents to take more time, more of their time, is there anyone else who has not been heard that would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else that has not been heard that would like to speak on this item? Okay. Mr. Ghosh, you uh, have the remainder of your time. Thank you, Mayor Shul. So I wanted to respond to some of the things we, we just heard. Um, it was mentioned that the mission statement in Woodcroft is, is that the neighborhood is to exist harmoniously with nature. However, it was also mentioned that the third fork creek is already polluted. And I think that actually highlights what the issue is here. Um, when Woodcroft was built, there weren't the same stormwater controls uh, required that are required now. And in fact, uh, one of the neighbors I know for, for sure who, who uh, spoke in opposition to this, her house actually is in the required stream buffer. If it were built today, it would probably be about 50 feet further from where it is today, and it wouldn't be that close to the creek. Uh, my point is not that those points are not valid or not valid concerns for the neighbors, but my point is that new development, like the one being proposed on the subject property, is subject to the new stormwater regulations, and it will be treated to a higher standard than anything that was built in that Woodcroft neighborhood. Uh, I, don't, I don't doubt that, that they are having some issues in that regard, but that should be expected because the stormwater controls were never put in place. Now, one thing that I didn't mention previously, uh, but is a, a portion, is a commitment on our development plan, is that the site is limited to 34% impervious. And I think that's significant. This is in the FJB watershed. So the, by right, the developer could do 70% impervious. So this is a reduction, of, a significant reduction in what they could build. Uh, and they've done that uh, part, you know, in part to control their stormwater the way they are required to, but also in response to the concerns that they heard from the neighbors. I do take issue with the idea that the developers have been deceitful. Uh, they, it, it is true that some of the proffers that, that were committed were, um, were discussed with a planning commission member, they were also discussed with the neighbors. And in particular, the condition related to putting sod on the slopes of the BMP, that came directly from a neighbor. It was never mentioned by any planning commissioner. Uh, so I, I do take issue with that. And I think we also heard again that, about uh, traffic on, on 54. And the reality is that the proposed project is not going to add a lot of additional traffic. Will it add traffic? It certainly will. There was one thing that was mentioned that I didn't quite understand. I believe somebody said that, you know, the developer is looking to do more developments and they want to connect everything up. There's one point of access to this site and it's off 54. There are no connections to any residential roads in, in Woodcroft or any other neighborhood. It's not even possible to, stub, to uh, connect to this parcel except from adjacent parcels on 54 if that happens. But it, it, it is not the case that there are other development proposals on the table. Um, ultimately, I will reiterate that, again, this is a small 25-unit townhome development on a very busy thoroughfare, Highway 54, uh, and it, it makes sense in this location. We do need housing in Durham. Uh, there are approximately 20 people moving here every day, and they need somewhere to live. And this is a, this is a sensible use for the location. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. All right. Um, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Anyone else? Yes, sir. Please come to the table, for, to the podium first. State your name and address. Uh, and then I'll ask you after that to please go over and fill out one of the yellow cards. Thank you. And let us know if you're a proponent or opponent of this, please. Uh, I'm opposed. Uh, my name is Larry Parrish, and I live at uh, Six Abaddon Way. It's my understanding with this development that you will come very, very close to my home. Uh, I have a special request in that my son is wheelchair bound uh, <clears throat> for the past five and a half years uh, with a TBI accident, 
and we uh, converted our uh, screen porch into a sunroom so that he can spend a great deal of time out looking in our backyard where there's a lot of trees. My request to you guys that you have mercy and consideration in the number of trees that you can cut down. My house slopes down quite a bit. The area they're going to build on goes up a great deal, so I'm going to be looking at a great deal of escalation and a great deal of trees cut down. And what my concern is, is that my son, who cannot talk, cannot walk, is going to be looking at a lot of bare land in the backside of townhouses. And so I would ask that you give great consideration. It's my understanding that the way you have things arranged now, that my home will be the closest to what you're building. And I just don't want my son to have to look out at the back of condos. And so if you would give great consideration to put in trees or some means that he can look at other than back of a condo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Parrish, I also want to say, I owe you an apology. You called me, and I meant to call you back, and I forgot. Well, I apologize thank you. For that. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Mr. Reese and uh, Ms. Austin for returning right. a call. I should have as well, and I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. I'm thank sorry. You. Council members, uh, 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 we have now added some, we gave a little additional time there to the um, the opponents, uh, and we will need, we'll add that time as necessary to the proponents. Mr. Gosha, you have some comments at this point. Yes, I sure do, actually. Uh, and we have met with Mr. Parrish, was it Mr. Parrish and his family? I'm sorry. Yes, and that is something we have given a lot of consideration to, and I recognize that uh, our, our consideration is not, is not something that is uh, reflected in the commitments. However, we do have a commitment to not uh, have any building placed, I believe, 60 feet from the open space parcel that is Woodcroft that your house backs up to. Uh, and so that area is, is in our minds, designated to be uh, undisturbed tree buffer. And though it is not part of our development plan, our, we have looked at, you know, preliminary layouts, and we are very, very aware of, of your request and are trying to develop the site in that manner so as to disturb the least amount of, of property towards your house on that backside. Uh, however, I do recognize that's not part of our commitments, but I did want you to know that we, based off the meetings we've had with you in the past, uh, we are looking into that and taking it very seriously. Mr. Ghosh, I don't understand why that would not be a proffer on your part. Uh, well, the proffer that is related to that is the 60 feet from the, from the southern property. The problem is I don't know how to, uh, we don't know how to uh, calculate the amount of trees that can be saved in that area. Now there's a, there's a stream on, the side, on that side of the property, so there's a stream buffer. And that is going to uh, obviously automatically undisturb buffer. Now beyond that, uh, it remains to be seen. It is a matter of how much grading needs to be done, uh, but we're looking to have our smallest building closer to that side uh, as far as number of units to building and the overall footprint of the townhouse building, we're looking for that to be on our, uh, on our southern, or towards our southern property line. All right, I think you have someone here to speak on that. Oh, yeah, and Landon might be able to speak to that as well. If I may, Mr. Mayor, I'm Landon Lovelace with Underfoot Engineering. Um, and I, I think the, the proffer of moving buildings a minimum of 60 feet off that southern property line came directly out of meetings with the adjacent owners. Um, we heard Mr. Parrish's story. Um, we did not get to meet him or her son, but there was, uh, Miss Maria was there and a few other folks were there. Um, and we, we were brought up to speed on the story of, of his son, and we made that proffer to move uh, a 60 foot minimum from the property line directly out of that meeting. In addition, there's, there's a 30 foot um, tree conservation area along that southern buffer. And then there's another, um, it varies from 20 foot to 120 foot of open space that's on the Woodcroft side between those. Um, we are very aware uh, of what that view is going to be, and we will make every effort during construction drawings to minimize that grading. As, as Neil mentioned, um, the proffer we made was a direct result of that conversation, um, and we're unsure, without making that portion of the site undevelopable, how to push that buffer even further. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lovelace. 
All right. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Anyone else? All right. Thank you. I'm now going to ask if there are any comments or questions for members of the council. Mr. Mayor. I just have a quick question for Mr. Ghosh, and then we'll, there'll be some other substantive issues. How's it going, Neil? All right. How are you? I have been 923 days since I think I said earlier. I don't recall ever seeing you come before us to argue on behalf of a matter that you considered as a member of the Planning Commission. Is that what happened here? Uh, that is what happened, and I don't know if during your tenure that has happened before, but uh, we w had not been retained by this applicant until after Planning Commission, and that has happened before. Um, I also wanted to ask about this right turn lane. Uh, accept your representation that all of the traffic-related agencies don't believe that it's necessary because they didn't tell you it was necessary, right? That's the position. Uh, yeah. More or less, yeah. Awesome. Um, but it, it is true that at least two, and by my count, closer to two and a half or three or maybe even four Planning Commission members strongly encouraged you to add that to your development plan. Isn't that right? That is correct. In fact, two of them explicitly said that they would only support this rezoning if you added that right turn lane, correct? I don't know if, what the exact number is, but yes, that was expressed at Planning two. Commission. It's two. Um, so had the Planning Commission been aware of your flat refusal to consider it today, um, the outcome at the Planning Commission might have been very different. Would you think that's a fair characterization? One, two, I, I really can't say that. The, did you, it did was you very clear that we were not committed submitted by the planning to commissioners? I'm sorry? Did you review the, plan, the written comments submitted by the planning commissioners? I did. Okay. And those don't necessarily reflect the spoken comments, and in fact, they voted in, to approve uh, this, and there was no, um, rec there was no um, uh, statement by the applicant at planning commission that they would add a right turn lane. That had never been conveyed to planning commission. <laughs> okay. Um, that's really all I have right now, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese, Councilmember Freeman, and then Mayor Pro Tem. I have a question for our city attorney, actually, regarding this situation. Is there any policy in place around our commissioners accepting representation on behalf of a developer? What is what is that? Um, there, the. When you serve on a commission, there are a code of ethics, um, okay. and that would include a conflicts of, of interest uh, that's similar to our standard conflicts of interest. Um, I was not aware that Mr. Ghosh was on, it, that the Ghosh here, I probably should have guessed that, is, is the same um, as, uh, as, as Neil standing uh, before us. Uh, but but there, are, there are definitely codes of conduct and ethics that apply uh, similar to as they apply to council members, yeah. Thank you. All right, I just, just in a general sense, are you in the habit of accepting cases you've already presided on? Is that? As I said, it has happened before, and for you, specifically, uh, yes, for our firm, yes, it has happened before. I do sit on the Durham Planning Commission and have opportunity to meet many applicants that come before the Planning Commission, uh, and sometimes we get contacted after they've come. Now, this particular applicant, uh, we have never represented on any project until. Now, so it's not the case that they were an existing client, and this was a project we weren't working on. This is a client that we never had until after planning commission. Um, therefore, there was no opportunity to recuse myself at planning commission, and subsequently, there wasn't a, a, a reason to uh, not accept representation on this case. You didn't Nothing see it as a conflict of interest. I'm sorry. You didn't see it as a conflict of interest. Uh, Advising the city council on the case, and then also. Representing the developer, right? So, per per the the rules of profession that govern attorneys, there was no conflict of interest. There was no overlap. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Councilmember Freeman? At this point, I, I just had one for the developer regarding the price point on these townhouses. My name is Josh Swindell, 4201 Yak and Drive, Raleigh. Um, did you have a price point in mind? Is this a diverse price point? Is this single? Like, where are your 
um, numbers lie where you're seeing the price point for these property for these 25 townhomes? Still a lot to be determined in budgeting, but as of now, um, starting in the upper 200s and going into the mid upper 300s. So upper threes. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if uh, someone from our transportation um, staff could weigh in on the right turn lane issue. Uh, Bill Judge, Transportation. The uh, uh, so uh, we discussed this with NCDOT based on the number of units proposed. Uh, the right turn lane is not required. If uh, the site were much larger, typically right turn lanes are required for much larger developments and upwards of 200 or more units. So, um, given the the size of the development, they did not require it for this this project. Thank you. Um, and I had another question for the developer around the tree areas. Could you um, give us some context around how much um, of the current woods that you all plan to preserve? Yes, I think Landon can speak to that. He's taken a, a minute to look that up for you. So I have a I have a tendency to be to to be wordy because I think these are complex situations. It should be an easy question. Um, I think the short answer is the minimum required is 20 percent. We've identified a number of areas on the site um, along the eastern property line. There's an existing stream um, that has different buffers on it based off the state classification of the stream. Um, the very southern portion is kind of the start of the stream, so it requires a 50-foot buffer from the top of bank on either side. Um, and then as it, as it moves further to the north or downstream, it goes out to a 100-foot buffer on either side. Um, all the area within that is identified as tree conservation. Uh, we have identified a small strip that will uh, require a sanitary sewer easement through it to connect to the existing sanitary sewer, which is also down in that stream corridor. Um, in addition to that, we've identified based off of Conversations and, and not just conversations with the Woodcroft folks, but the, the adjacent owners to the north, kind of where the important tree conservation areas are. Um, so we did do an, an additional 30 foot buffer along that southern strip um, where we spoke before about Mr. Parrish's property and not just Mr. Parrish, but a few other neighbors there with the concern about looking up the hill. Um, so the, the short answer is the minimum requirement is 20%. We provide that at the PDR during. Um, the next stage when we go through design, preliminary subdivision plan and construction plans, the intent is to, to minimize clearing of trees as much as possible. Obviously, there's some grading that needs to be done to develop the site, but um, at that price point and the product that they're trying to put out, it behooves everyone to, to save as much of the trees as we can. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and a final question for the developer. Have you all considered um, proffering a contribution to the city's affordable housing fund. I've been talking with the with the the applicant on the uh, about that on this project and um, the last proffer we've been looking at different proffers that have been uh, offered before on previous cases and there was a I believe it was Watkins at Witherspoons there was like $25,000 or it's like $250 a, a unit um, and at that at that kind of a rate, at 25 units, the it would equate to about $6,250. And uh, we recognize that this is a very important issue in the city of Durham. And so the applicant would be willing to uh, proffer a one-time payment to the city's affordable housing fund of $7,000 to, to uh, support that very important issue. Thank you. I just want to... Um... It costs us between forty and fifty thousand dollars to subsidize one unit of affordable housing, and while we are grateful for any um, you know voluntary commitment on the part of the developer, I just want folks to have that number in mind: forty thousand dollars minimum to build one affordable unit is you know, and that's and the need is really significant in the community. 
Um, so of, we, of course, uh, value any contribution, but I just want folks to understand that that is the, those are the numbers that we're dealing with. Thank you. Let me ask staff, was that, that, that was a proffer. Was that, that, was that an acceptable proffer? Is the way it was expressed? Do you need a, do you need a time certain when the proffer will be actualized? Yeah, Jamie Sanyak with the planning department, that proffer is acceptable. Thank you. Council Member Alston. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify that, um, uh, Mr. City Manager, that the code of ethics you're referring to is specific to the Planning Commission with regard to, to, to uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Apologies. I'm sensitive to that. <laughs> um, the code of ethics you referred to applies to the Planning Commission specifically, or is that a general code? That's of our general code of ethics for all of our boards and commissions. And do we have a clear answer as to whether or not this is consistent with the code of ethics for our boards and commissions? I would need to know more about when Mr. Ghosh was contacted by the developer, I will tell you that just off the cuff, I've got concerns about this um, and may want to talk to council if the code doesn't spe specifically speak to this particular issue, we may want to take a look at it. It, it never dawned on me that a, that, a commission, that a planning commissioner would be representing an applicant in front of the, the, the council, regardless of when the the uh, representation occurred. Mr. Um, Mayor? I'll just, I'll just say finally, um, without clarity on that, I just share that concern about sure. moving forward at this point. Um, Mr. Mayor, if it's appropriate, I would like to ask if it was possible to request more time on this case and to let our city attorney review the code of ethics specifically and then also some of the proper language and making sure that it's all lined up before we move forward. Okay. Uh, anyone else like to speak on this? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I, I, I guess my, my comments have been, have been somewhat impacted. I want to thank uh, Councilor Alston, who um, uh, anticipated uh, my question. And I was going to put to the city to attorney very directly um, because things have been said. And I'm, I just came to an election, so perhaps I'm a bit hypersensitive about innuendo and nuance. I wanted to put to the City Attorney, very directly, is there anything improper about Mr. Go standing before us this evening? And if not, I, I think fairness dictates that we make that clear uh, to folks sitting in this chamber and watching at home that, that it is not the case, that it's improper. And if there are some questions, if there's some gray areas that we need to look at, then it sounds like it's tending more towards that. But I was going to ask the City Attorney for a definitive statement so we don't adjourn tonight and, and people are wondering, based upon innuendo and nuance, uh, that this, this uh, gentleman is engaged in anything improper. I think that's the, the minimal standard of fairness we ought to be engaged in tonight. So, but I do, I don't know if that was a, a motion on, a, on behalf of Council Freeman, but I did have some substantive questions to the actual um, merits uh, of the, uh, so is, is it appropriate for me to, Continue, Mayor. I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask how this suggestion comports with the will of the council, okay? I'm going to suggest that we keep this public hearing open. If we close the public hearing, then it would have to be re-advertised. It would have to be a long series of events. Uh, I'm going to suggest uh, that we adopt uh, Council Member Freeman's suggestion that we continue this. So we'll continue this public hearing. Uh, and I think that we should decide when we're going to continue with two, with sixty, so days. that the applicants and the uh, and the, uh, the 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 opponents, people in the neighborhood, uh, will have some certainty about about that. Now, we are in a situation where uh, we are about to take a uh, a recess in the council's meetings. Our next council meeting is. Can someone help me? August. August. August 6th. Yes, August the 6th. I don't think that would be an adequate time. So I'm going to ask uh, that we, I'm going to ask my colleagues that we uh, keep the public hearing open with a plan to come back to it on August the 6th. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to hear any thoughts that you all have on that. I would I concur with you, Mr. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, I don't have a problem with that, but I do feel like as the person who raised this issue, I need to be clear about my perspective on this. I'm, I'm not the city's attorney, but I am a lawyer, 
uh, as Mr. Ghosh is. Um, I, I, I don't believe that Mr. Ghosh has any uh, improper intent or motive in representing his client today. I don't believe that that's the core of the problem here. In my view, the problem is more on the other side from the public perception. Mr. Ghosh, I want the people of Durham to know that when you're sitting in the Planning Commission, you're making decisions that are in the best interest of the city. And I don't want anyone to think, to ever think, that you're making a decision because you think maybe someone will hire you to do a job about that case later on. I don't want people to think that. I don't think you would do that. My perspective of you as having worked with you the last two and a half years is I don't think you would do that. But not, not everyone in the city has that same experience working with you. And so to the extent that this happens, um, we need to really have some very clear kind of rules about when it can happen, the kind of disclosure that needs to happen around it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's appropriate for members of the council to see, see you come up to the podium and having read your written comments from when you, had, when you decided on the planning commission. Um, and so I'm, I'm supportive of the delay so that at least we can get some clarity on, on that particular issue. And my hope would be that in the interim, um, the developer will take a look at this tree coverage issue along the, the boundaries where people are living now. Um, I think I, for one, am very sensitive to the issue that, um, that in any event, that, that's, that's what I hope will happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Are there other comments by members of the council? I do have a question, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. as to what is the actual question we will be seeking an answer to in the interim? What, 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 are, we, what are we going to be researching? What will that process look like? What is the issue to which we're seeking an answer? I think we should. I'll, I'll say what I, I would hope that we would get some clarity from the city attorney, which because I don't have it, on what are uh, the, the question that Councilmember Austin raised. You know, what what are the what are the what is the rule, uh, and how does it apply in this situation? Mm -hmm. And I, not there. Listen, our, we got brilliant people up here. Is is that? Is the inability to kind of clearly or succinctly go to the rule now or state it just by virtue of, you know, your general working knowledge of it suggestive that this may be an uncharted area? No. Can we not use Westlaw or something? I'm going to ask, the, I'm gonna ask our attorney to respond. To With, without having the actual code of ethics in front of me, nor having You don't have to commit it to memory? <laughs> I, I, I don't, believe it or not. Um, but but the, the main issue is that, that if Mr. Ghosh would be amenable, I'd like to have a conversation with him about what his role was when he first talked to the developers and then applied the facts of the case to the Code of Ethics. That will not take 60 days, but unfortunately you don't have another meeting um, uh, until, until July and, and August. Well, August 7th. August 7th. Right. Right. All right. Council members, without objection, I'm going to uh, declare that we are continuing this public hearing. Is that the appropriate language? Mm -hmm. We're going to be continuing this public hearing, and we will be hearing this again on August the 7th. Is that correct? 6th. And I also want to second uh, Council Member Reese's uh, statement that I hope that during that period of time, the developers might be continuing to work with the neighborhood on the uh, tree buffer issue and uh, and the tree save uh, and would appreciate uh, would appreciate that those discussions continuing on behalf of the developer in the neighborhood, folks. I know that a lot of you all came down here tonight and uh, were expecting and hoping for some sort of resolution. And I'm sorry we can't give it to you, but I feel like we're making the best decision. And I'm appreciative of you all being here. Thank you so much. All righty, we're now going to move on to item. 46, the ordinance revising capital facility fees for 2018 and 19. Uh, this is a public hearing, and uh, I will uh, ask if we could please hear from staff. Um, good evening, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Good evening, Don. Don, Don Greeley, Department of Water Management. Um, the item before you tonight is a, um, is a um, recommendation to revise the ordinance for the capital facility fees for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, capital facility fees are considered system development fees. System development fees are one-time charges assessed to new water and sewer customers for their use of system capacity and serve as equitable method 
by which to recover upfront system capacity costs from those using the capacity. In years past, um, capital facilities fees were usually approved when the water and sewer rates were approved by council. However, there have been some changes to the general statutes, one of which now requires that a public hearing be held prior to the council approving the capital facility fees. Um, under North Carolina General Statutes, Chapter 162A, Article 8, um, provides for uniform authority to implement system development fees for public and water sewer systems in North Carolina. And this was passed into law in July of 2017. Um, according to the statute, system development fees must be adopted in accordance with the conditions and limitations of Article 8, and system development must conform to the requirements set forth in Article 8 no later than July 1st, 2018. Um, the city engaged a, a, a financial consultant, Rep Tellis, um, who prepared a, a report that's attached to the agenda item concerning the uh, calculation for the upcoming, um, for the, the uh, ordinance for the capital facility fees, which is in front of you. Um, we've met all the requirements under the general statutes for public notification, and with that, I, I'm here to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. You've heard from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open and ask if there's any question for staff members at this point. If not, uh, are there any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Any members of the public? Any other questions or comments from council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. To adopt the ordinance? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Greeley, thank you. We'll see you in August. All right. We're now up to item 51. Mayor. Oh, yeah. Do you... Um entertain a more public airing of the question that I whispered across the table oh, at sure. you a few minutes ago. Uh, the question is, do we need to vote on the keeping the public hearing open? And we do not need to vote on keeping the public hearing but open. But aren't we continue it to a, aren't we continuing this hearing to a date certain on August sixth? Um, That's council meeting. It is. If it was beyond that, I would say you would need it to stated that it's the next I, I will just say that Is there any harm in making that motion it has been our practice on the council in the past that the mayor keeps public hearings open until the next meeting um, if you I, I, so my only hesitation in voting on that is to start the precedent that you have to. That, that 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 that's not uh, appropriate uh, so I'll, I'll defer to your judgment Mr. Mayor thank you <laughs> my judgment is often wrong <laughs> but uh, perhaps it's right in this case Okay. Mr. Attorney, you want to add anything? You're good with that? I'm good with that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we are now at item 51. Uh, item 51 is Drake Avenue and Sovereign Street closings. We have... We have four people that would like to speak on this item, uh, but first we will hear from staff. Good evening. Good evening. Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. Hillendale Partners, LLC, proposes to close 157 linear feet of Drake Avenue and 143 linear feet of Sovereign Street public right-of-ways. These rights-of-ways are currently dedicated but have not been improved to city standards. The request is intended to help facilitate the future development of land off of Hillendale Road owned by the applicant. If, requested, if the request is approved, the closed right-of-way acreage will be added to the adjacent parcels as shown on the plat. Staff rec recommends that council approve the permanent closing of both the 157 and 153 linear feet of these streets. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare the public hearing open. And I want to ask at this point, are there any questions from members of council or staff? <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm sure this is in the report and I just forgot, but could you remind us who owns the property on either side of the of the proposed closing area?
Yes. On attachment five of the street closing plat, you'll see at the top parcel A and parcel B. And same thing with attachment six. So if you want me to read the property owner's names, I can, but they oh, are listed you. on the plats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff at this point? If not, we have four speakers on this item, all of them proponents. I'm going to read their names, and if you all could please come to the podium to my right. Uh, the first is Ed Hallberg. Mr. Hallberg, congratulations. Your handwriting has improved since you last spoke to us. Uh, Jamie Greener, Bruce Herod, and Tom Miller. Mr. Hallberg, I'm going to ask you to go first. Uh, if First of all, let me ask, are there any opponents who would like to be heard on this question or anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hall, Mr. Hallberg, uh, I'm going to give the, uh, I'm going I'm I'm to give, how about this? I'm going to give you each two minutes and hope you don't need to take it all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, in keeping with this evening's baseball uh, theme, can you please excuse a last minute uh, substitution as a pinch hitter who uh, batted out of order mm -hmm. in the previous, uh, previous meeting? Yes, we can. Uh, I am here with the, uh, the Hillendale Partners to uh, we own the property either outright or through contract on the um, uh, along Hillendale Road uh, to the west of these closings. Glad to answer any questions that anyone has. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now I get Adding it. Out of order is normal. Now I get it. Out. I got it now. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, All righty. And then I believe a second. I called Jamie Greener. Hi, my name is Jamie Greener. I live at 2410 West Club Boulevard. Um, I am here today on behalf of the Watts Hospital Hillendale Neighborhood Association, of which I am the vice president, and I'm urging the council to vote in favor of the street closing of these paper streets, Drake Avenue and Sovereign Street, west of Tampa Avenue, item 51 on tonight's agenda. The streets have never been built and are artifacts of a street network designed without thought or consideration to the local topography. Uh, a perennial stream runs, I'm sorry, a perennial and jurisdictional stream um, runs north-south parallel to Tampa, just west of the backyards of the applicants on Tampa Avenue. Um, were the unimproved lots along this paper street of Chesterfield to be developed, the currently non-existent streets of da uh, Drake and Sovereign would be uh, crossing this stream and disrupting its delicate ecosystem. I would like to call your attention to Comprehensive Plan Policy 4.2.1a, which promotes low-impact development to promote streams and mitigate harm from stormwater. Construction along, over, or through this perennial stream would be in direct conflict with that policy and would likely have a significant negative impact downstream. Neighbors on the south end of the stream already face non-trivial concerns, uh, flooding, um, and further development or restriction of the stream would only make that situation more dire. A small group of concerned neighbors have been meeting regularly to discuss uh, the possible issues of land development in this area and have met several times with uh, Jim Anthony, the developer who is assembling this land between Tampa Avenue and Hillendale Road. Um, Mr. Anthony is well aware and in full support, as you heard of this street closure, as a member of the board and a concerned neighbor, I uh, urge you to vote in favor of this street closure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greener. Mr. Harrod. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council members. Uh, I'm one of the property owners and one of the applicants at uh, 2217 Tampa Avenue. And pretty much, uh, very, uh, Jamie covered all the issues I, that I wanted to cover. That You know, we, we have worked in conjunction with the developer all the way through the process. Uh, Right now, we have six streets within my immediate neighborhood, of which six, there's six of those that are closed up on one end or the other. So there's really no access through the neighborhood at Tampa, uh, Alabama, uh, Drake, and Sovereign. Uh, so that, that complicates things. And there are older design streets, you know, 20 foot wide. 60 foot right of ways, no curb and gutters, no sidewalks, and uh, not designed for a lot of traffic. So uh, I think that pretty much covers everything. Uh, 
uh, like I say, of course, being one of the applicants, we uh, would appreciate very much if y'all would vote in favor of this. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Mr. Miller. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Tom Miller, and I'm speaking to you tonight as a member of the board of the Watts Hospital Hill and Dale Neighborhood Association and a member of the committee that has been working on this project. I did want to make sure you understood that the actual applicants on this are the adjoining residential property owners and not the Hill and Dale uh, Commons folks who have assembled the property behind it. Um, the real issue here is one of the system of, of dedicated but not completed public streets and the fact that they're sitting on top of a jurisdictional stream. So they can't be built like they are. The, as they are, however, they are an impediment to the future development of the property over there. They're an impediment to the future good development of the property. They're an impediment to the future bad development of the property. Whether that development of that property in the future is good or bad is something we will uh, deal with later. But right now, there won't be any development of the property unless we begin to close these street rights of way. You can't develop it like it's laid out. It's got to be a new system. We in the neighborhood are looking forward to what we believe is the potential good development of this piece of property. And because we look forward to that and we have faith in our development neighbors and in this city council and our planning staff, we want to begin the street closing process now as step one of removing the impediments and going on and making a good project here at some point in the future. Do we know today what that will be? No, but we have begun discussion with the property owner. They know what we want, uh, and they're pondering it, and we hope for a good outcome. But let's close the streets now so we can get started. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm available. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? If not, are there questions or comments by members of the council? Do you mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Ms. Sonyak. I apologize that I hadn't picked up on this when I looked at the item when I first reviewed the agenda. The uh, this portions of Sovereign and Drake that are immediately west of these segments that are proposed to be closed, are those currently closed? No, they are not currently closed. So, so why aren't we going to close the entire short blocks and only half the blocks? I'm, I'm not sure if, an app, if the... Does one of the applicants, does the applicant uh, want to respond or does one of the proponents of this want to respond? I think it would be more appropriate for the applicant to respond. Okay. Mr. Herod, would you like to respond? Did you understand the question, Mr. Herod? I hope I do. Uh, okay. We only want to close the western section. Well, uh, yeah, I assume the applicant can't because they're only closing the section that's adjacent to their property. That's correct. Oh, but the properties that are immediately west of there, it seems like it doesn't make sense to only close half of that segment of the right of way. Did you all look at any, any evaluation of why not to close the entire segment or content? Since Sounds to me like the developers that we're talking about are, the, you know, are trying to, to facilitate are the are going to be those property owners. Uh, Mr. Manager, Pat Young with the Planning Department. I think the short answer is because that wasn't petitioned by this applicant. Um, it's something that the city could initiate uh, subsequently, kind of to clean, clean this up, if you will. Um, we would we'll need to make sure that there wasn't um, sole or primary access for remaining remainder pieces off of this property. It doesn't look like that would be the case. But um, but isn't it the, uh, that not that the, the side of the, the property that is proposed to be considered for some future development? <coughs> yes. Um, part of the issue is that the bike ped group had asked for uh, retain, retained or provided access for pedestrian and bicycle movement. And I think there was some possibility that the developer may want to use those uh, remainder segments of uh, Sovereign and Drake to provide that pedestrian or bicycle access. So I think we, we kind of took a wait and see attitude about what the final development proposal from the development group looked like before proceeding uh, with that closure. Okay. Thank Certainly you, think it's, it's my understanding that they intend to uh, address that when they submit the site plan for approval and rezone. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Harrod. Thank you, Mr. Manager. That's a good question. Uh, council members, any more questions or comments? If not, uh, I have a, a question. Uh -huh. The waterway that's on the, is that the western portion of the streets that aren't being closed? Is it, what's the name of that waterway? It's just a, probably an unidentified stream buffer. Unnamed. It's unnamed. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of that. I think it's unidentified. What does it lead to? That would be great, probably. Go ahead, Mr. Miller. Uh, that's a tributary. It's a perennial stream tributary of LRB Creek, which it joins in the Hilladale Golf Course immediately to the south. Thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, or comments, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Do I hear a motion to adopt the order permanently closing the so moved. streets? Second. Uh, any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, could you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here very much. All right. Now we'll move on to uh, item 52. Thank you for your patience. Um, item 52 is also a public hearing item. <laughs> Bush Street, Bush Drive Street closing. Jamie? Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Eden's Land proposes to close 874 linear feet of public right-of-way. The right-of-way is currently dedicated but has never been built. The street closing request is a requirement of a tax commitment associated with zoning case Z1700014 and of a site plan condition of approval for the DLLTRR LLC property. <clears throat> if requested, if the uh, request is approved, the closed right-of-way acreage will be added to the adjacent parcels as shown on the, the plat. The street closing plat must be closed and the plat must be recorded prior to the site plan approval and prior to the site development commencing. Staff recommends that the council approve the permanent closing of 874 linear feet of the street. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff and now I'm going to declare that this public hearing is open and I want to ask first if there are any questions for staff. If not, we have one speaker on this item. Do you, John, have a question? Do you have some questions? Just a question regarding these street closes. There's a number of them this, this evening. Is I just would like to know what the numbers look like in the past. It seems like quite a bit. This is a larger number than we usually have in a meeting, for sure. In any one meeting, but they yeah. do happen. Over the last often. year. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Edens, you are. Uh, we're glad to have you, uh, sir. Uh, you have two minutes. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Anyone else? Mr. Edens. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate evening. your time this evening. I'd like to say that you saved the best for last, but you got me, so I can't say that. But I'll do my best to finish things up here. Uh, this project was rezoned by council about a year ago. One of the conditions to that zoning was to close the adjacent right-of-way. There's a 30-foot right-of-way of Bush Street. We need to close that in order to, to, with, to continue with development. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edens. All right. Are there any questions for the applicant or for staff? Any comments? Any questions or comments? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Do I a motion to adopt an order to permanently close the 873 linear feet of Bush so, Drive? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much, Mr. Edens. Now we have one more item. I'm, I'm sorry. Motion passes 5-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Okay. Thank you. Um, we now have uh, one more item, uh, I believe, uh, only one, which is item 16, Racial Equity Task Force. We have one speaker on that item. Uh, and that's Mr. Chris Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany, uh, please come forward and you have three minutes. Thank you. 
Um, read what I've already written, but listen to a, a teenager Madam Clerk, with tears Madam in Madam Clerk, eyes. could you run the clock, please? Thank you. Three. Three minutes. Thank you. Um, read what I've already written to you, but listen to a teenager with tears in his eyes. Mr. Chris, you know how they do us out here in target areas. You have a responsibility to go down town and tell them they won't listen to us. And kids signed up to speak about racial profiling when it was on the city council agenda here and upstairs were not allowed to speak. And discussions were limited to racial profiling at traffic stops, drivers, not pedestrians. Public transportation helps people get to work. But when they tripled the fares for teenagers, they were not allowed to speak again. And they had to stop the meeting and clear people out. There was so much anger. We don't want all those poor people downtown. So it was made harder to get in and out of downtown Excuse on the me. bus. Excuse me, Chris, could you pull away from the microphone a little bit? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, and for similar reasons, black poor getting jobs in RTP called monkeys, quote unquote, the Durham City bus station for the shuttle system in RTP was closed. And when I went to evening meetings at the Holton Career and Resource Center, um, the bus does not go there in the evenings. And when I was asked to mention it to a city council member at that, at one of those poverty reduction initiative meetings, she said, I don't care, I don't ride the bus. Mm -mm. The CPRB, you know they're clueless and they don't take complaints. Gave me one minute to speak when there were two speakers. And bus uh, rider ambassadors were told by data management and the board not to bring them complaints. And when there were five speakers signed up, they said there were so many speakers signed up, five, that they would only allow two minutes each. Heavens, that they should have to listen for more than 10 minutes total to speakers re representing tens of thousands of so-called riffraff, ignorant bus riders. And when I tried to talk to the chief about stopping public strip searching, right out here, she said, I don't wanna hear about it, and turned her back and walked away again. Members of the public should be allowed to speak for at least three minutes each. Racial equity task force members should be appointed by city council. Um, listen and learn from others' various different experiences. Listen and learn and make sure accurate notes are kept of problems and suggestions. I hereby nominate Ashley M. Kennedy of McDougal Terrace of PAC-4 between Durham Tech and NCCU to be one member, hopefully to serve as chair, and she should be asked to nominate a young black male from that same unposted target area, and some of the other members should be true grassroots representatives of other unposted, targeted, majority-minority neighborhoods where cops have said, you deserve whatever happens to you living here, and we stop and search young black males because that's who commits the crime. And, when, and where PAC-4 conservatives, former teenagers, have said such things as teenagers are all criminals. Listen and learn from teenagers. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. All right, council members, uh, we have before us item 16. Uh, you have heard uh, Mr. Tiffany on this, and now um, uh, is there any discussion, or do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution amending the Durham, I'm sorry, to uh, support the establishment of racial equity task force? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Just real quick, I want to thank the city attorney for his quick work on the, uh, on the bylaws here. That was awesome. Indeed. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second to support the establishment of a racial equity task force. And I'm going to ask the city clerk to please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. Is there any more business to come before this body? If not, I am going to declare this meeting adjourned. 937. <laughs> and I will see you all six weeks. Oh, we'll see you Thursday afternoon, Mr. Weeks. Mayor. <laughs> see you Thursday afternoon.